HRC, 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 HRC. Hebrew reader, Hebrew reader, Hebrew reader, church. Shout out to Talim, everyone. We hope everybody's doing well today. This is Hebrew Readers. We thank you all for joining us today, and we hope that you enjoy this amazing lesson that we have for you all today. Our lesson today is walking with wisdom in all relationships. Okay, so we're going to go into all scenarios of how we're supposed to operate, and even when things come against us, that may be not ideal or things come against us from our day to day, how to go about those situations according to the scriptures. All right. Um, please visit the website at www.hebrewreaders.com. Please subscribe so that you can get our lessons when we, when they air and definitely hit the notification button and we appreciate you all. All right. I'm your brother, Zach Wah. For many of you guys that follow us, we thank you and we praise Allah Hayim for you. I also have my brother Kasafo with me as well. Peace be with you all. All right. Without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started. We're going to jump into this lesson. Um, wisdom of relationships. Now, this is going to go into pretty much all your relationships, no matter if it's with a spouse or it's with a parent or a child or a friend, this is going to be relative. Okay, so good friends. We have to be able to decipher good friends that love us and hold us accountable versus bad friends that enable us being respectful of persons or envious, not wanting to see us do well. We have to have that. We have to be able to decipher that. Um, Brother Kasov, can we start in Proverbs 27 and 6, please? Yes, sir. Proverbs 27 and 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Right. So faithful are the wounds of a friend. So a friend, it may not feel good when they're bringing something to you that they may see. But that's actually signs of a good friend because their wounds are faithful because they want to see you do better. They want to see you be a better person. And that's what friends are for, is to hold each other accountable for us to grow together. And that's why we have many friends that don't stick with us long or that they're friends for us for a moment and then we outgrow our friendship. It's because that friend didn't actually hold us accountable. And when we're growing, that friend may be an enabler, may be trying to pull you down or trying to keep you where you are because that's where they want to stay. And a lot of times you outgrow that friendship because they're not willing to take accountability and to grow and work on themselves as well. So uh, let's jump over to Psalms 141 and 5, please. Psalms 141 and 5. Let the righteous smite me. It shall be a kindness. And let him reprove me. It shall be an excellent oil, which shall not break my head. For yet my prayer also shall be in their calamities. Right. So let the righteous smite me. Let me have a good friend. And if they smite me, or if they correct me or reprove me, it shall be a kindness to me. And I have to view it as such if that's what I'm looking for. If I'm looking for a true friend that's going to hold me accountable and that's going to help me grow and that's going to grow with me as sharpened iron, as iron sharpened if iron, if I'm looking for that, I have to have that perspective and that mindset and that viewpoint that it's a kindness when they reprove me or when they see something and they come bring it to me in love that I may receive it in love and not receive it in hatred. And let him reprove me. It shall be an excellent oil, which shall not break my head because you're not going to die. 
it's actually going to make you better. For yet my prayer also shall be in a calamity. So I'm going to pray that they don't fall either. Even though they're reproving me, I'm not going to get bitter. I'm not going to get angry. I'm not going to operate and allow malice to enter into my heart to want to see them fall or want to see them do something wrong. But my prayer is going to be that they have perfect prosperity, as we learned in the, the previous lessons. So we want to make sure that we're not harboring any other spirit, but the spirits of Elohim, right? Let's um, continue in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24, please, Casa. Sure. Proverbs 18 and 24. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Right. So a man that has friends, you actually have to be friendly. You actually have to have that 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 openness, that cheerfulness. So you actually have to show yourself friendly. Just like how it talks about how a teacher has to be apt to teach. Like you have to be a friendly person. You can't be groggy and and mean and and um distant and not um conducting yourself in the spirits that actually would draw people to you, which are the fruits of the spirit. So you can't operate in the works of the flesh, but yet desire to have friends, right? Because the works of the flesh are going to push people away from you, while the fruits of the spirit are going to draw people close to you, right? So there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother, and that is true, especially if it's a true friend, according to Elohim, that holds you accountable and that wants to see you do well. Um, let's jump over to Sirach 6 and 5 through, we're going to read all the way through 17, please. Sirach 6 and 5. Sweet language will multiply friends, and a fair speaking tongue will increase kind greetings. All right, so speaking, speaking words of kindness, words of encouragement. All right, we have to be positive. We have to be joyful, which is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Right, so that we're actually not being negative towards others or to ourselves. And it starts with us because we have to treat ourselves as the scripture says, love thy neighbor as thyself. So for many of us, it that that saying doesn't really hold much weight because we may not be treating ourselves well either. So the first thing is that we actually have to start treating and, and loving ourselves and loving the creation that Elohim has created in us and then putting on those spirits that Elohim has asked us to partake in so that we can actually be that joyful and that peaceful and that loving person that we, that we seek to be. Go ahead, Brother Casa, please. Verse 7, if thou wouldest get a friend, prove him first, and be not hasty to credit him. Right. So if you do get a friend, or if you meet someone, and you guys connect, and you guys are like, yeah, okay, like, we'll stay in touch, you know, and you guys are building that bond. Don't be hasty to credit them. See how they live. Watch their works. Watch how they deal in situations. Watch how they speak and treat people. And those things will give you understanding of who that person truly is. So we actually have to be able to be vigilant and to see who a person is and truly see who they are. Go ahead, Brother Costa, please. Verse 8. For some man is a friend for his own occasion. I will not abide in the day of thy trouble. All right. So this is why we have to truly understand not to credit a person or credit a man or a woman. Because some friend, some man is a friend for his own occasion. So there may be something that they see that they can gain from you. Or there may be something that they desire. Or they may, may not sometimes even have good intentions towards you. They may be jealous or envious of you. 
So that's why many of them will not abide in the day of thy trouble. Because they were waiting on your downfall. They were waiting to see you fall and waiting to see you in a place where they could feel better about themselves, seeing that they are doing well and they're up and you're down. All right, And that's not a true friend. So that's why we have to be able to decipher these things and we have to be vigilant and not be hasty to credit a man or a woman, but watching their actions. For you know a man by their life. So by paying attention to how a person lives and how they go about things and how they treat others really tells you how they're going to treat you as well. Continue, Brother Casa, please. Verse 9. And there is a friend who being turned to enmity and strife will discover thy reproach. Right. So no matter what the case is, there's a friend who being turned to enmity and strife. So they may have not started off that way. It may have been sincere from the beginning, but as they got to know you, jealousy could have came in. Envy could have came in the mist. You never know what's going to happen or what's going where there's going to, going to be a turn in a relationship. So you have to be very mindful and paying attention of even your friends to see what's going on with them. When you see things that change one day, being mindful of it and, and being on guard and watching. And if it's something that needs to be corrected, you yourself have to then hold your friend accountable and say, hey, I see this going on. What's, what's, are you okay? Is everything all right? What's going on? Is there something you want to talk about? Because we have to hold them accountable too. So if it doesn't cease, of course, there's scriptures of how we go about that. If they don't change or they don't correct the thing that you brought forward, of course, we all, Elohim has that, and we're going to get there later in the lesson. But you have to be mindful that if they don't change, they're going to discover thy reproach, and it's going to end up being a snare to you. It's going to end up biting you because they don't have good intentions or they don't have a good view of you any longer. So they're looking for something. They're, and this is where we get into when people are looking for something wrong or they're looking for something bad, that already tells you that their intentions are not right and they're not pure and they're not good towards you. And we're going to get into these things to understand how to go about situations like that. Uh, continue, Brother Casa, please. Verse 10. Again, some friend is a companion at the table and will not continue in the day of thy affliction. All right. So some people, when they're, when they're benefiting from the friendship, they're there. And they're just they're your best friend. They're there. Anything you need, they got you. But as soon as things are not as well and they're not benefiting or or some some even are not getting that um, that stature or that recognition that they like being around you, they're not going to continue in the day of the affliction because their motive for being around you was for their own image. So it's or for their own gain. So as soon as that is taken away, they're taken away because their intention wasn't pure towards you in the first place. So we definitely have to be mindful of the people around us, whether they're truly there to help us and help us grow and build, or if they're actually there to tear us down and watch us fall. So we have to be mindful. That's why Sirach says, um, if if you, uh, it talks about how you can, if a man has a one faithful friend, it's like fine gold. Um, you remember the scripture, Casa? Um, a faithful friend is a strong defense, and he that had found such a one had found a treasure. Sirach yeah. 6 and 14. 
It's a rock six and fourteen. We're getting there, huh? It was coming. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> Ooh, I was just sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's keep going. There we go. Verse eleven of Sirach six. But in thy prosperity, he will be as thyself and will be bold over thy servants. Now, look at this. Now, we have the sign. Remember, we said we have to be mindful and not be hasty to credit them, but we have to be vigilant of them. And if we're not paying attention to the signs and the wisdom that Allah has given unto us, it's going to end up catching us later. If there's in thy prosperity, he or she will be as thyself. So they'll be equal with you. Even if you're the one prospering, they take it as we're prospering and will be bold over thy servants. So you see the boldness come in. They feel like what you have is theirs. And they're going to treat everything you have as if it's their own and not have any respect towards you. So we we get to see that sign right there. Go ahead, Brother Casa. And what happens if you don't catch that sign? Go ahead, Casa. Verse 12, if thou be brought low, he will be against thee and will hide himself from thy face. Right. So you be brought low, he's gonna be against thee because in their eyes, you made the mistake that lost us everything. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> and will hide himself from thy face. So you're not going to see him. They're not going to come around anymore. Because you didn't catch the signs of why they were there in the first place. That friend sounds like a narcissist. A narcissistic yeah. discard. And many yeah. times that's what it is. And some people, it can be other people too, though. Yeah. Now, now we're going to understand what Sirach 6 and 13 is going to say. Go ahead. <laughs> Separate thyself from thine enemies and take heed of thy friends. Right. So when you see these things, when you see these things that are transpiring, you have to understand whether that person is holding you accountable and truly wanting to see you excel and grow, or if that person is enabling you and envious and maybe envious of you or jealous of you and wanting to see you fall down. You have to understand that because that person that's enabling you and wanting to see you fall and envious of you and jealous of you, that's your enemy. That's not your friend. And take heed of thy friends. So you also have to be mindful and watchful, even for your friends. For many a times, if you don't catch things that your friends are doing to hold them accountable, you're allowing them to go off into a spirit where it's going to end up hurting you later. So this is why, even amongst friends, we all have to be watchful and hold one another accountable and not be a respecter of persons, not to correct one another, but to correct one another, to not suffer sin upon one another. Because if we don't correct one another, it gives place for the devil. And the devil can operate and eventually it's going to it's going to grow and it's going to grow and it's going to grow because it's like a cancer that's left untreated. If you don't actually treat the cancer, you don't actually do what's needful to eliminate it or to kill what it's feeding off of or to take care of the other part of the body that's deficient, that's allowing everything to be stored up in that cancer, then it's literally just going to continue to grow. And it's the same with us. If we're not going to 
correct, to hold one another accountable, and to speak up about things in love, then it's going to hurt everyone in the situation. So if someone is operating in the spirit of envy, anger, pride, or any other spirit of hatred toward us, it's best to separate for well-being's sake if they're not willing to take the correction. And that correction is, is spoken twice. It says after the first and second admonition, reject. And that's in the world. There's another way to deal with things in the church, but in the world, it's, hey, I'm speaking to you about this. Okay, if you're not taking heed, you continue doing it. I'm speaking to you about it again. This is the second time. And after the second time, if they don't change, leave them alone. There's not a third time to speak about it. Because they're showing you that they're not going to change. And if you stay in that relationship, and they are continuing to do that, what you're telling them is that what they're doing is okay and you like it. So according to Alahayim, seeing that Alahayim holds us accountable and Alahayim is not an enabler nor a respecter of persons, he's like, operate the same way that I do. I'm going to tell you something once. If you, if you, if you hear me, I gain my brother. I gain my friend. I understand it may be a struggle, so I'm going to tell it to you twice if you continue doing it. Allah am willing. You're like, man, you know what? I, I didn't even notice I did it. I'm sorry. I gain my brother or my sister. But if they continue on, they're not going to stop because it shows that they don't respect you and they don't have that much consideration towards you. So we're learning how to deal with people according to the scriptures and in the ways of Allah. Hayyam. Let's continue, Brother Kassan, Surah 6 and 14, please. Well, it's interesting that Allah Hayyam actually oh, speaks. Kassan. I'm sorry, man. Go ahead, man. I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't mean to leave you out. It's okay. I just yeah. learned I just learned something. I didn't realize that two admonitions for a heretic comes from how Allah Hayim operates because he speaks twice in a vision. According to Job, he says he speaketh once, yea, twice in a vision in a dream of the night. So he literally tells us twice and then leaves us if we don't take heed. Mm. Interesting. That's in that is interesting. <laughs> The further solidifies it. <laughs> yeah, I was like, wow. <laughs> okay. Whenever you're ready, brother. Thank you. Sirach 6 and 14. A faithful friend is a strong defense. Now, interesting. Why is a faithful friend a strong defense? Seeing the things that we've went over thus far in this lesson, seeing that we're only at the beginning. Why is a faithful friend a strong defense? Because a faithful friend holds you accountable. And the faithful friend doesn't suffer sin to come upon you because they're, they're speaking about it and bringing it to you so that it doesn't continue to grow and become a huge snare for you, right? So they're defending for you by holding you accountable and bringing things for you to actually see and to change. So a faithful friend is a strong defense from the enemy. Continue, Brother Casa. And he that hath found such an one hath found a treasure. And he that hath found such a friend hath found a treasure. Because there's not many people that actually want to see you do well in this world. And that's just a true fact. There's not many people that truly, sincerely want to see you do well and even to do better than them. That's very rare. For many people, it's like, you can do well, you just can't do better than me. So to find a true faithful friend in Allah Hayyam, 
It's very rare. And you have found a treasure. Continue, Brother Casa, please. Nothing doth countervail a faithful friend, and his excellency is invaluable. Amen. Continue, please. A faithful friend is the medicine of life. And they that fear the Lord shall find him. A faithful friend is the medicine of life. Because a faithful friend is keeping you from, from festering evil spirits. A faithful friend is, is stopping them from being able to operate in you from the things that you can't see. See, this is why it's so important for us to have faithful friends is because many a times there's a lot of things that we can see ourselves, but there's many things that become habitual that we do that we don't notice. So to have that friend seeing things on the outside to help us with the things that are unseen to us actually brings it to our awareness so that we can be accountable and that we can actually fight against the adversary. So a faithful friend is the medicine of life. And they that fear the Lord shall find him. Because that friend, that faithful friend, comes from Elohim. It's Elohim sent. So be very, very mindful. Because you have to actually fear the Lord to find this friend. You actually have to, to walk in his ways and be striving to do what's right. Walking and striving in the commandments. Holding yourself accountable to walk in the fruits of the spirit and not allow the works of the flesh to enter into your habitation. Continue, Brother Costa, please. Whoso fareth the Lord shall direct his friendship aright. Mm -hmm. For as he is, so shall his neighbor be also. Right. So you guys, because doing what's right in the sight of Elohim is the, it's the mutual thing in a relationship, you're both going to continue to grow because you both are, are in agreement. And with Elohim being the mutual thing between you guys, it creates a standard for the relationship where it can't be a double standard. It's either I'm wrong because I didn't do what Elohim said, or I'm right because I did what Elohim said, and that's what I'm bringing to you. There's no middle ground. And many a times that pride of that middle ground is what causes much contention because if you have two people that are right in their own sight there's going to be contention and there's pride in the midst because nobody wants to humble themselves to Elohim but if you have two people that fear the Lord that fear Elohim it's going to direct their friendship aright because everything is according to the standard of Elohim. Like, man, okay, I'm bringing this to you, brother. You know, I, I see that you were struggling, and this law right here is what what's the issue? Okay, that that's right. Yeah, I did break that law. You know, I'm sorry. Let me examine it. Let me reason with myself, and let me work through it. Oh, let me talk to you about it. <laughs> you right. brought it up. You saw it. Well, help me understand. This is what I've been that's, doing. That's coming up. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Go ahead. It's going to come up again. We'll dig into it again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the, the part that I thought this is great because it showed why friend, faithful friend is a medicine of life. Why as a brotherhood in the church, we actually have to come together and talk about stuff with each other. Because the scriptures show it, every man doesn't know everything for himself. Right. You know, it's made so that we have to 
lean on each other and get help. You know, of course, through repentance, there's things we'll learn from Allah Hayyam himself through repentance. But a part of the guidance from Allah Hayyam to come to repentance is doing well and communicating, confessing faults to one another, talking about things, getting insight so that we can actually grow and listening to one another, being able to receive a wound from a brother because it's faithful and it's a kindness to us to help us heal through that medicine. Amen. And even if a brother or sister may not have the knowledge to actually truly bring them out of or to actually bring clarity of what they're actually dealing with, the scripture does tell us if we have understanding, speak it. If we don't, to put our hand over our mouth. So we have to also guard ourselves, at least pride entered into our habitation to speak on something that we're not fully aware of. And that's okay. It's okay to bring something to somebody that you see that you're not fully aware of to, to give clarity unto them. Because they can, it, it comes to their awareness for them to actually go and find where the answer is. To go speak to a counselor, to their counselor, if, if their friend is not their counselor, or to go speak to the elders of the church in our case, you know, so that we can actually get the understanding to come out of it. But that friend is the one that brings it forth, that brings it to the acknowledgement so that then you can actually see it to deal with it. So let us not be afraid to speak to one another in love so that we can actually help one another, though we may not have the answer. You got anything, Kasim? Oh, that's right. I'm good. Thank you. Um, let's jump over to Sirach 37 and 12, please. We didn't do six and six. Oh, yes, please. Sirach six and six. Be at peace with many. Nevertheless, have but one counselor of a thousand. All right. So be at peace with many. You may have a lot of friends, okay? And that's cool. It's cool. Praise Allah that you have a lot of friends that you could be at peace with. But nevertheless, have but one counselor of a thousand. So if you're going to have one of those friends that you go to and you speak to for, for counseling or to help you work through a situation or to see things rightly, let it be one. You don't want to go to multiple people that are going to give you different answers where it just brings confusion. And there are guidelines and stipulations to who that counselor needs to be. Can we jump over to Surah 37 and 12, please? Yes, sir. 37 and 12. But be continually with a holy man whom thou knowest to keep the commandments of the Lord, whose mind is according to thy mind, and will sorrow with thee if thou shalt miscarry. Right. So that counselor needs to be a holy man that whom thou knowest to keep the commandments of Allah. Not just that they're saying they're doing it, but you have to judge that man according to their life to see how they're conducting themselves, how they're walking and dealing with other people, how they're dealing with their family. You actually have to watch that man and see if that man or woman is actually keeping the commandments and whose mind is according to thy mind, that they're actually striving to be in, in a certain place. And if it's someone like that, they're going to sorrow with you if thou shalt miscarry. If you fall, they're not going to judge you and ridicule you. They're going to have compassion on you, knowing what they've been through themselves. And that's what you're looking for. Because think about it. We just went over the scriptures just a moment ago that one friend, let's see, um, Sirach 6 and 9, it says, and there is a friend who being turned to enmity and strife 
will discover that reproach. So if you pick the wrong counselor and you're going and you're speaking about things to that, to that counselor and they're discovering these things about you and they're not that holy man or that holy woman whom thou knowest to keep the commandments, they're going to discover that reproach and they're going to use it against you. So we have to walk in wisdom in these relationships. Let's jump over to Sirach 37 and 15 and 16, please. Sirach 37 and 15. And above all this, pray to the Most High that he will direct thy way in truth. Right. So even with the counselor, above, above the counselor, Pray to Allah Hayyam, that he would direct that way in truth. So don't put the counselor above Allah Hayyam. Okay? So we have to make sure that we keep Allah Hayyam first. So make sure our reverence for Allah Hayyam is above even our friends. Definitely above our friends. Even though that holy friend coming from Allah Hayyam, you can't, you can't give more homage to the creature than the creator. Continue, Brother Kassel. Let reason go before every enterprise and counsel before every action. All right. So let reason go before any business decision that you may make and counsel before every action. So before you do something or you make a decision, Make sure you counsel. So we don't want to be hasty in anything. We want to take our time. We want to make sure that we're doing things right. And in practicing that, it's going to, it's going to formulate in all our life, even our relationship with Allah Hayyam. See, that's why it says faith is like a mustard seed. Because no matter where you place that mustard seed, it's still going to grow and it's going gonna, it's gonna to become big. Just as implementing something in one part of your life. If you start saying, okay, I'm going to take counsel before I do anything or before I make any decision. That little mustard seed that you planted, as you continue doing it and watering it and watering it, it's going to start flowing into other parts of your life. It's going to flow into your, your relationship with your children. It's going to flow into your relationship with your parents. It's going to flow into your relationship with Allah Hayyam. It's a mustard seed. So just as faith is a mustard seed, if we start implementing faith in one part of our life, it, be it starts becoming a habit. It starts, we start reprogramming our mind to then operate in that pattern. And that's what actually allows the mustard seed to grow. So, it's good for us to understand this so that we can actually pick an area, no matter what it is, and start operating and implementing things in that one area so that we can actually practice. This is what we're doing. We're practicing and reprogramming. And by doing that, it's going to actually elevate us in other areas of our lives. You got anything on that, Casa, before we keep going? No, sir, that was good. Thank you. Uh, let's jump over to Sirach 19 and 13, and we're going to go all the way down to 17, please. Sirach 19 and 13. Admonish a friend. It may be he hath not done it. And if he have done it, that he do it no more. Right. So if something happens between you and your friend, 
And, and this can go into any aspect, any relationship, whether it be a spouse, whether it be your children. Okay. Admonish a friend, it may be that he have not done it. And if he have done it, that he do it no more. All right. So go forth and ask him. The first thing you need to do is say, hey, did you do this? Before you come with the judgment. And that's another place where we can actually start implementing things to get us out of hastiness. Admonish a friend. Go and talk to them. Say, hey, you know, I don't know if this is if this happened or if it's true or not, but I want to talk to you about it. It may be that he have not done it. And then he can actually, or she can actually tell you what actually transpired. And if they did do it, that they may do it no more. Go ahead, Brother Carson. That was a good precept in Sirach 11 when you said to ask him about it first talk about it don't blame them without speaking about it first Sirach 11 and 7 blame not before thou hast examined the truth understand first and then rebuke amen Sirach 19 and 14 admonish thy friend it may be he hath not said it and if he have that he speak it not again. So it's the same thing. You got to ask questions, not just come that they done something and you're coming with judgment, right? Because that's hasty, right? So we're coming out of hastiness. We want to make sure that we do all things in, in according to Allah, right? And according to his spirit, right? We want to be um, patient, Right, and long suffering. Continue, Brother Casa. Verse 15. Mm -hmm. Admonish a friend, for many times it is a slander, and believe not every tale. Right. So go and ask them. Even if someone else has come and told you something, still go and ask them and don't come with a judgment. Because many a times it's a slander. So we're not supposed to believe every tale. So it's good for us not to be hasty, nor to get into our emotions. As you see here, that hastiness comes with emotions. Somebody may have told you something and you may have got angry. You may have gotten bitter. You may have, no matter what emotion it is, you still have to be temperate and go and ask. And don't take other people what they say for, for face value. Because you have to examine them too. And see what they have need of. Because they may be jealous of the relationship that you have with someone else. Or envious. You don't know what's going on with that person. So you definitely have to be vigilant toward them as well. So we have to be patient and slow to be angry so that we can actually go and have a conversation and see if what actually was told to you was true. Right. Remember, wrath uses provocation by a word. By word. So right. That's slander. It sets us up to be in our feelings and go blame our friend without even talking about it. Right. I'm ready whenever you are. Sirach 19 and 16. There is one that slippeth in his speech, but not from his heart. And who is he that hath not offended with his tongue? All right. So there's one that may have been hasty. You know how many a times we may have said something not fully thinking it through or being hasty. But you may have said it, you may have slipped with your speech, but you didn't actually mean it like that from the, from the heart. 
it may have been misinterpreted because you didn't actually get your words together. So that does happen. So you have to be considerate of those things and compassionate, not just to take things to heart. Because this happened to all of us. That's why I say to who is he that have not offended with his tongue? We've all offended somebody with our tongue. And what did we and what did we do? We wanted the person to forgive us. Right? And that's where the law comes in. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Don't sit there and hold a grudge against thy neighbor for something that you know that you've done before. And you seek forgiveness. I'm ready, Brother Casa, please. Verse 17. And monish thy neighbor before thou threaten him. And not being angry, give place to the law of the Most High. Amen. So admonish that neighbor. Ask thy neighbor before you come with judgment. And not being angry. Admonish them not being angry. So don't already be in your feelings and you come and you try to speak to them. But give place to the law of the Most High. All right? So even if you do get angry, go sit upon that bed before you go talk to your friend. Go breathe. Go gather yourself. Because your friend can, just like all of us, if somebody comes to us and they're flustered and they're, and they're trying to hold in that anger, it's going to affect the dialogue. Because you're going to catch the poison. The other person is going to catch the poison. Especially if they're not strong in the faith. Now, as we continue, Elohim does give us understanding of who we should make friends with and who we should not. All right, let's read on to um, Proverbs chapter 22 and 24, please, and 25. Sure. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 24. Make no friendship with an angry man and with a furious man thou shalt not go. Okay. So we see a man that's constantly angry and he's always dealing or operating in anger. Don't make friends with that man. And with a furious man, thou shalt not go. You see a man that's always angry or is furious or even, even in a situation where you see the man is furious and he's asking you to come with him or she's asking you to come with her. Don't go. And for a lot of us, we've had situations where our friend may have had some relationship and they furious about something that happened and they like, come with me. We're not supposed to go. All right, so keep that in mind. Continue, Brother Casa. Lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. All right. At least you catch that poison too. And you end up in a situation where you have to then operate the same way. Because say that person went over there to confront somebody and it ended up being a bad situation where now you got to jump in to protect your friend. And you get a snare to thy soul because you were wrong too. I'm taking in somebody else's sin. All right. 
right so so we get to see the scripture has much wisdom for us to walk in mm -hmm. right and we're going to continue so that we can understand how to operate in all scenarios right let's jump down to Sirach 7 and 12 and 13 so we can understand lying and we're not going to go deep into lying but there is you can definitely go and check out the lesson um what's the name of the lesson concept do you remember catching a catching uh, catching is the it? lie or a lie catching the lie okay the lesson catching the lie if you want to actually go deep into lying uh, go ahead brother casa so rock seven and twelve devise not a lie against thy brother neither do the light to thy friend right so don't devise a lie. I said, devise not a lie against thy brother. Why would a person devise a lie against someone? Usually, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Kasa. I hear you. <laughs> to get something they want. That is one. Yes, it is. So usually it's, it's guile. So you see how treacherous the dealings are. We're not supposed to deal treacherously with one another, nor with Elohim, because you're doing it against him too. Just as we, we've spoken about how the things that we do in our life or the things that we do in one aspect or area of our life, we do in different areas or aspects of our lives even against Elohim. So if we are in the habit of devising a lie against our brother or our sister. We're doing the same thing in other areas. Even if we're devising a lie against Elohim to get what we want. Just as Satan himself devised a lie and told Eve that Elohim was jealous of her. He devised a lie against his brother. Neither do the like to thy friend. Right? You don't want to do that toward your brother, toward anyone, and also definitely not toward your friend. Go ahead, Brother Casa, please. Use not to make any manner of lie, for the custom thereof is not good. All right. So don't do any manner of lie because once that once that spirit enters into your vessel, it's going to it's going to move itself to other parts of your life. Okay. Uh, let's read Proverbs 26 and 28, Brother Casa. Proverbs 26 and 28. A lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it. And a flattering mouth worketh ruin. All right. So we get to see that it's the spirit of hatred that actually causes a person to lie. Just as we've seen, devise not a lie against thy brother. Right? So we see that the motive is hatred. So we don't want to operate in the spirit of hatred knowing that it's the work of the flesh. But we're supposed to be operating in love one toward another. All right. So we can't be lying to one another because that actually shows that we hate. We hate that person. And we don't want that spirit dwelling in us. Um so rock 22 and 20, please. And we're gonna continue to think 22. Okay. So 22 and 20. Whoso casteth a stone at the birds, frayeth them away. And he that upbraideth his friend, breaketh friendship. All right. So let's get the understanding of upbraideth so that we can understand what's actually being said here. Um, upbraideth is G3679, Casa. It means to defame. That is, rail at, chide, taunt. Cast in teeth, suffer reproach, 
or to reproach, revile, upbraid. Right. So we're looking at the fame. So let's put this in this proper context. Who, whoso casts the stone at the birds, frayeth them away. So a stone hurts. So if I throw a stone at birds, they're all going to move because they don't want to get hit. Right? And he that upbraideth or defames his friend breaketh friendship. Why would a person upbraid a friend? Pride, envy, jealousy, bitterness, wrath, anger. You see where we're going. None of those spirits are the spirits of Elohim. None of those spirits are the fruits of the spirit. So we get to see what actually is causing us to then do something like this to a person that we refer to as a friend. And we also get to see what's causing someone to do it unto us, if that's the case. So if someone speaks bad of you or brings up accusations or says things that you've told to in secret, in confidence, to then make you look bad, or to destroy your, your name, you see what spirit is actually operating in that person. And Allah am willing, it's not operating in us. Let's continue, Catholic, please. Verse 21. Though thou drawest a sword at thy friend, yet despair not, for there may be a returning to favor. Now, this is rare. <laughs> <laughs> it said despair not, for there may be a returning to favor. There's, there's not many people that would actually forgive you for, for defaming them or upbraiding them and it's going to it's going to speak on it continue concept if thou hast opened thy mouth against thy friend fear not for there may be a reconciliation except for upbraiding so there may be a reconciliation but in these specific cases it's a lot of times hard to be reconciled when it comes to a friendship all right so except for upbraiding or pride or disclosing of secrets or a treacherous wound for these things every friend will depart All right so these things we definitely want to stay away from All right we don't want to defame we don't want to operate in pride toward our friend we don't want to disclose secrets or things that they've told us in, in, in confidence, right? Or we don't want to bring a treacherous wound against them and do something that's that's foul toward them. Okay. Now what comes with pride? All right. Uh, let's read Proverbs 13 and 10, please. Proverbs 13 and 10. Only by pride cometh contention, but the well-advised is wisdom. Right. So we see Sirach 22 and 22 says, except it be for upbraiding or pride. Now, a lot of times when pride comes in the midst, there's contention. So a lot of people that, that may go into argument, that may go into an actual physical fight, that may go into many different things where pride is actually the culprit of it. So many a times, when it reaches that point or when that pride cometh in and that contention cometh in, you may lose your friend or you may get to see where that person is in your life. Okay? But what? Even if that pride and that contention may come, 
or that upbraiding may come, or that disclosing of secrets or that treacherous wound, how are we to operate even after the fact of such a thing happening to us? All right. Um, let's read Leviticus 19 and 17 through 18, please. Leviticus 19 and 17. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am Ahaya. So even if they've done wrong to you, you don't bear a grudge against them, nor do you try to avenge yourself and make them feel the way that you felt or give them a taste of their own medicine. But we shall love them as ourselves, knowing that the avenging comes from Elohim. And we shall not hate them either, though they may have done something wrong to us. And we're not to hate them. Though we may have to separate from them, we can't allow hatred to, to dwell in our hearts. And if there is room to reprove them, then you want to rebuke them in love and not suffer sin to be upon them. Right? So we definitely want to give those two admonitions if you are able to be at peace with them. If you're not able to be at peace with them, then just separate from them for the sake of peace. All right. Let's go ahead and read that so that we have um, the first and second admonition. Uh, Titus 3 and 10. Titus 3 and 10. A man that is an heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject. All right. Um, can you give the definition of heretic, Casa, please? Sure. Heretic, a person who promotes schism. All right. Okay. Um, schism is... What? A split of division between strongly opposed sections of parties caused by differences in opinion or belief. Right. So they may not be in agreement. They may have their own thing that they believe and it causes that division. All right. So a lot of times that's exactly what it is. Um. That's why when a person, if you come to them and say, hey, you know, um, I don't like when you do this, you know, and it makes me feel this way, you know, um, can we work on something so that this doesn't continue happening? And they may have their own belief or their own opinion of something. And that's why the person doesn't stop doing it. So you have to understand that that's the belief or the opinion that that person has and that they're walking in. And many a times after the first and second admonition, you're going to see if that person is going to change what their opinion or their belief is, or if they're going to actually make the necessary change for the sake of the relationship. So we get to actually see that it's actually a opinion or belief that that person has okay and that's why a lot of times they don't stop because they actually though it may be wrong to you it may not be wrong to them and though it may be wrong to Elohim it may not be wrong to them so we have to understand that and we have to walk in wisdom Now, what do we do if we're doing what Titus said, Titus 3 and 10, if we're going to give the two admonitions, right? What do we do if that person does not agree? Uh, let's read the Testament of God, chapter 6, verse 6, please. Testament of God, chapter 6, verse 6. And though he deny it, and yet have a sense of shame when reproved, 
give over reproving him. For he who denieth may repent, so as not again to wrong thee. Yea, he may also honor thee, and fear, and be at peace with thee. And if he be shameless, and persist in his wrongdoing, even so forgive him from the heart, and leave to Allah the avenging. Right, so we get to see in the testament of God is actually going through the whole process of Titus 3 and 10. All right. So you may have the first admonition, right? And they may deny it, right? And yet have a sense of shame when reproved, right? Give over reproving them. So that's the first admonition. You said what you said. Okay, leave it alone. But he who denieth may repent so as not again to wrong thee. So though they may not have said, I'm sorry, I'm wrong, they may not do it again. Right? And that may actually happen during the first or the second admonition. Right? He may also honor thee and fear and be at peace with thee. Right? But if he be shameless and persist in his wrongdoing, so after the second admonition, and they be shameless and persist in doing what they're doing, even so forgive them from the heart and leave to Allah the avenger. So leave them alone and leave Allah to correct it. Because you have to understand that they're not doing it against you. They're doing it to Allah too. Because the things that we do in the physical, the things, the habits that we pick up and the things that we do, we're not doing it to one another. We're doing the same thing to Allah and And this is just where it's playing out in the physical for everyone to see. The same way we're operating out here in the earth and toward our brothers and sisters, it's the same way we're operating toward Allah so we leave them to Allah for Allah to avenge. Allah is going to deal with them. But we can't get into bitterness or allow an evil spirit to then enter into us because somebody's doing wrong to us. Right. So we also have to be on guard for ourselves, for our own soul and our own salvation. Let's jump back over to Titus 3 and 11, please. So now we're going to more understand what Titus 3 and 11 is talking about from Gad chapter 6, verse 6. Titus chapter 3, verse 11. Knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. All right. All right. So we get to see that though they may not repent and say sorry, they may change and do what's right because they're condemned of themselves. It's Allah that's going to condemn them. Okay. Now for us, even as Gaz said, forgive them from the heart. Right? Let's jump over to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 through 26, so we can see how us being believers should operate even when someone's wronging us, or just at any moment. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If Allah and preadventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Now, there's many interesting parts about this. It says, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. So we have to be meek, and we have to be. Um, What's the word? Um, temperate in all things. Not giving ourselves over to emotions so that we can actually stay in that meekness and actually instruct those 
and give them understanding. If Allah and pure venture would give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So we have to be that good example for them so that they have no excuse. But if we then operate in, in emotion, we give them justification to stay where they are. And this is our part to play, to actually help in our brothers and sisters. That they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. So if we operate correctly, it's actually helping them recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Who are taken captive by him at his will, right? And the reason they're taken captive by him at his will is because they're given over to their emotions. And the and the and the devil plays in emotions. So we have to understand that that person is going to be hard for them to do what's right, being so emotional or so drawn or privy to emotions, because we know that they're literally in the devil's playground. So we have to then be more grounded. And standing on the rock of Yache, not being moved by emotion, to then be able to pull them out of it. All right. So, with this, we have to understand that, um, especially for people that are given over to emotions very privily or easily we have to understand how to deal with them as well. Um, can we read Proverbs chapter 22, verse 10, please? Yeah, sure. Proverbs 22 and 10. Cast out the scorner, and contention shall go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. All right. So we get to see that, we see that a scorner, is usually a person that is given over to emotions or given over to anger or given over to whatever emotion it is. And contention shall go out. All right? So if there's no peace after the first and the second admonition, all right, you have to separate yourself from that person. All right? And this is many relationships in our lives. Right. And once you separate yourself from that person, the contention is going to go out with it because it's always going to show once something gets removed, it then sheds light on what is left. So if you don't know where the problem is coming from, separate and you'll see that wherever the problem was, it's going to stop. Contention is going to go out with it. It's going to stop. And there's going to be peace again. And that is the clear indicator of who it was that was operating in such a spirit. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. Because they're not able to then operate in those emotions, to operate in those spirits. They're not able to manipulate one person over here or one person over there. They're not able to, to slander here. They're not able to whisper here because they're out of the picture. All right. So these are things that Elohim shows us to truly help us in situations and to operate and walk in wisdom. Can we read Proverbs 16 and 19 so that we can see what mindset that we should have? Sure. Proverbs 16, verse 19. Better it is to be of an humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. So it's better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly. So though that 
that one person may have it may have benefited you in your life. It's better to to have less and be at peace. So we have to have that mindset. We can't be looking or allowing people to hang things over our heads to have a certain lifestyle or to or to have certain things that we desire because that is going to end up being a snare to us. And we're going to end up being in situations that Allah Hayim truly doesn't want us to be in if we were only listen and do what he's instructing us to do. But it's because of our hard-heartedness that we have to go through many afflictions for the sake of our growth. Because we don't want to listen. So we see it's better in the sight of Allah it's better for us to be alone and be in a house full of contention because Allah loves us that much to say hey I would rather you be at peace than to be going through hard times but it's our decisions that our self will that actually makes us go through hard times a lot of times And though we may learn the lesson, we may could have learned that lesson an easier way by just humbling ourselves. So we see even for Proverbs 21 and 9, it says it's better to dwell in the corner of a housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. So we can't just be fixated on this world and what it has to offer. We can't be fixated on our image and our stature in this life. Allah Hayim said it's better to dwell in the corner of a housetop so to have a little bitty space than to have a wide big old house with a contentious woman or in a relationship with a contentious man. We have to think about these things. Right. So our goal here is to learn and to, to grow and walk in the Allah wisdom in all situations. Right? Allah says, what does Allah say in Proverbs 16 to 20, Brother Kassab? He that handleth a matter wisely shall find good, and whoso trusteth in Ahaya, happy is he. Right. So we handle that matter in Allah wisdom, we're going to find good. And whoso trusteth in Ahaya, right? Because if you trust in his wisdom and you trust what he tells you to do, you're going to be happy. Because Allah doesn't make mistakes. And he has wisdom from the beginning of the world. And beyond that, before the world was even created. Allah is not going to tell us to do something that doesn't work or it's not for a reason. It's our lack of trust in him that causes us to operate in self-will, to think that we know better than him. And he knows the end of the thing. Right. So I believe we will be happy to do what he says, knowing it's for everyone's best interest. Amen. So let not hatred enter into our hearts. Can we read Sirach 10 and 6, please? Sure, Sirach 10 and 6. Bear not hatred to thy neighbor for every wrong, and do nothing at all by injurious practices. All right. Injurious means causing or likely to cause damage or harm. 
right? And a lot of times that's spite or avenging yourself, right? So we're not supposed to bear hatred to our neighbor for every wrong, right? So anything that they do, we just mad at them. Anything that they do, every mistake that they make, we're mad. That's not right. But we're supposed to have compassion upon our neighbor and love our neighbor as ourselves. And then we're not supposed to hold a grudge and avenge ourselves. So we see and do nothing at all, nothing at all by injurious practices. So don't take it upon yourself to avenge yourself. All right. Let's continue in uh, Surat 9 and 1 so we can get other examples of hatred so that it may not work in us. Surat 9 and 1. Be not jealous over the wife of thy bosom, and teach her not an evil lesson against thyself. All right. So here again, we see that avenging yourself or that... um. Or that I'm going to give you a taste of your own medicine. So be not jealous over the wife of thy bosom. So even if she's um, doing something that's well, or he is doing something that's well, don't, don't get jealous. Right? Because we have to, even in relationships, we have to be that that holy friend. And we see a lot of times that that's lacking in relationships. That you actually want to see each other excel and do well. But instead, you end up being that enabler. That person that's envious and jealous and bitter and angry against your spouse. So then you go and teach them an evil lesson against thyself to pull them down instead of wanting to see them do well. Sharpening one another. We're supposed to be in agreement. We're supposed to be walking and Allahim together. Holding one another accountable. To let not the devil have a place. Can we read Proverbs 11, 29? You got anything on that, cousin? No. Oh. That's good. Thank you. We're still on it. Let's keep on going. <laughs> Proverbs 11 and 29. He that troubleth his own house shall inherit the wind. Right. So he or she, this goes either way, that troubleth their own house shall inherit the wind. Right? Because if you're not standing on Yache, just like Adam and Eve, when they went to stand in the rivers, and they were both standing on the rock in the river. Look what happened when Eve didn't stand on the rock. She didn't stay on it. The devil came and blew her and blew her away. So we get to see what that wind is. He that troubleth his own house shall inherit the wind. The devil has place. And the house can't stand. Now, what would be a reason for someone to trouble their own house? Can we read Proverbs 15 and 25, please? Ahaya will destroy the house of the proud. So pride is one of the things that cause someone to trouble their own house. 
And we see that it's actually a higher that's allowing it to happen. He's destroying the house to, to cast out the pride. And why is he doing that? Can we read Proverbs 12 and 3? A man shall not be established by wickedness. So he's destroying the house of the proud by allowing you to destroy your own house and the devil to come in so that the man or the house is not established upon wickedness. And by him doing that, what is actually happening? Read Proverbs 29 and 3. In Proverbs 29, 23, a man's pride shall bring him low. And by that same thing, Allah is going to bring you low because of it. So there's actually a deliverance that comes through it. Though we could have done it the easy way, Though there was an easier way if we would have just humbled ourselves. Oh. Let's continue, Kasa. But honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. But honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. So Allah, I am doing this to bring the person of pride low. But honor is upholding the humble in spirit. So though the other spouse may have to go through what they have to go through for the pride of the other spouse, honor is going to uphold them because they're going to hold fast to Allah through it all. And that's the humility. Because what, Casa? Proverbs 12 and 3. The root of the righteous shall not be moved. Right. So that man or that woman that's humble in spirit, that root is not going to move. Though that prideful spouse or prideful person may come and operate in their pride trying to tear down the house, and allow the devil to enter in through them. The root of the righteous isn't going to be moved. It's only going to strengthen the righteous. And let's read Proverbs 12 and 7, please. The wicked are overthrown and are not. But the house of the righteous shall stand. All right. So Allah may allow it for a time that the house may get overthrown, but it's to bring the person of the pride low. But the house of the righteous shall stand. Allah knows. It's a light thing for Allah to tear down and build up. But we also got to see that the root of the righteous wasn't moved. So though everything around them may have been going into turmoil, their faith and their walk wasn't moved. So we get to see that it actually stood. It, it withstood the storm. Can we read First Peter chapter three verse twelve, please? For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. 
but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Right. So we get to see who Elohim, he loves and keeps his eyes on those that are doing right. And his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. So it's actually Elohim that actually withstands the people that don't do right. So we have to understand that it's evil spirits that overtake us if an evil desire enters into our hearts. So we have to be very mindful of that. Can we read Acts chapter 19, verse 16, so we can understand that? Acts chapter 19, verse 16. And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. All right, so that we can understand how evil spirits operate. If, if we have a desire in our heart that's against the ways of Elohim, it gives place for an evil spirit to then leap on us and overcome us and overtake us where we operate in that evil spirit and they prevail against us. So we have to be mindful and rid ourselves of all desires that's not of Elohim so that there's no place for the devil in us. And that's going to help us with all our relationships, whether it be with our children, whether it be with our, our spouses, whether it be with our parents, whether it be with any relative. So whether it be with any of our relatives, whether it be with any of our friends, we're learning how to, to overcome any spirit to have placed in us to cause us to operate in a way that's going to harm our relationship or that's going to offend Elohim. So we truly get to see why it's so important, especially going into um, just looking at any relationship, but also looking at the end times. Because the last thing we need in the end times is for a spirit to have place in us, to then allow an evil spirit to then jump upon us, overtake us, cause us to sin, and then leave us because of a desire that we have in our own heart that we have not overcame or that we have not dealt with. So we actually get to see the severity of this when it comes to anything in our life. Now, can we read Sirach 33 and 3 so we can understand why the law is so needful for us? Go ahead, Brother Kassam. Sirach 33 and 3. A man of understanding trusteth in the law. And the law is faithful unto him as an oracle. All right. So by us truly walking and trusting in Elohim's wisdom, the fruits of the Spirit and the commandments will build others up around us and ourselves. All right. Can we read Psalms 128, verse 3 through 6, please? Sure. Psalms 128, verse 3. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Thy children like olive plants round about thy table. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth Ahia. Ahia shall bless thee out of Zion, and thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. Yea, thou shalt see thy children's children and peace upon Israel. So we get to see the benefits of us trusting in the law, right? And being faithful to the law. We get to see the benefits of it. Uh, can we read Sirach 14 and 20 through 21 as well, please? 
to rock 14 and 20. Blessed is the man that doeth meditate good things in wisdom, and that reasoneth of holy things by his understanding. He that considereth her ways in his heart shall also have understanding in her secrets. All right. So it goes back to what is important in your life. It's actually keeping these commandments important in your life. It's actually keeping the fruits of the spirit. Is it important in your life? Because it said, blessed is the man that doeth meditate good things and wisdom. That means that it has to be on your mind. It's not just understanding or knowledge or something that you pick up and that you know. And you're like, okay, I read that or I know that. It actually has to be important in your life. And that reasoneth of holy things by his understanding. So you're reasoning, you're thinking about things, you're 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 seeking to understand because it's important. He that considereth her ways in his heart, you're considering the ways of wisdom. You're thinking about it, it's on your mind. Shall also have understanding in her secrets. Because eventually, you're going to get the understanding. So it really boils down to intention. What are your intentions? What is important to you? Because we know that even in the world, when something's important to us, we make time for it. And we see even here, it's the same principle. We're going to make time for the things that are important to us. And we're going to put forth that effort to understanding and, and applying and doing the things that are important to us. So we have to examine and reason with ourselves. Can we read Sirach 4 and 16, please? Sure. Sirach 4 and 16. If a man commit himself unto her, he shall inherit her, and his generation shall hold her in possession. All right. Now, we're talking about wisdom. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. If a man commit himself unto her, he shall inherit her. Now, the word that we're looking at here is commit. Let's get that. Let's get the definition of that word. Let's see, commit. Commit means pledge or bind a person or an organization to a certain course or policy. To carry out or perpetrate. So to carry out. You're committing to something. You're carrying it out. You're seeing it through. You're holding fast to it. That means that it has to be important to you. But no man commits themselves to something that they don't truly believe in. Or that's not something that they hold of high value So for us, we have to commit ourselves. And that's the only way we're going to inherit wisdom to then be able to walk in wisdom. And what is she going to do for us if we commit ourselves? Um, Sirach 14 and 26, please. He shall, set, he shall set his children under her shelter and shall lodge under her branches. Uh, I think you cut out on my end. Okay. Sirach 14, 26. He shall set his children under her shelter and shall lodge under her branches. All right. So Alhaim is going to put us under her where she's going to be our shield even in this world. She's going to guide us. She's going to lead us. 
to help us in situations. And if we actually commit ourselves, just like the scripture says, it says, and and his generation shall hold her in possession. All right. So by us making the sacrifice, it's going to also benefit and help our children as well, even as it's helped us to this day by our forefathers that actually did right. Um, let's read Sarat 1 and 15, please. Sarat 1 and 15. She hath built an everlasting foundation with men, and she shall continue with their seed. So that's actually how it actually works. Because of our commitment, our children get to inherit based off of our good works. So we have to truly be selfless in this, seeing that it's it's more than just us and our own desires. It's about our posterity. It's about our children after us. And what they're going to get, what they're going to inherit. For many of us, we're, we're working on our children inheriting carnal things where moths and, and, and dust can, can destroy. But what about the spiritual things that they're going to inherit? What about them inheriting the Holy Spirit and wisdom for them to, to understand and to walk in and to grow in? We have to get away from the carnal things of this world and truly focus on the spiritual things that are going to last forever. So let's understand why being in agreement is important in any relationship. Can we read Sirach 13? Verse 16, please. Sure. Sirach 13 and 16. All flesh consorteth according to kind, and a man will cleave to his like. Now, this is very interesting and very important. So, if, so let's just say a person struggles with pride, right? More than likely, that person that struggles with pride is going to cleave to others with pride. And the reason being is so they they won't get reproved, seeing that they're all operating the same. So they would rather be in the midst of enablers that are trying to cover their own faults than to be with someone that's going to hold them accountable. So we have to be mindful of this. At least we fall into the same. Right? So... All flesh consorted according to kind, and a man would cleave to his like. Right? So if we are seeing pride, or we're seeing anger, or we're seeing any spirit that's not of Elohim, that's operating in the people that we're around, we should examine ourselves. That's a good indicator that, hey, something's going on with us. If we see that our friends are fornicators, that we're hanging around, we should examine ourselves. All right? So that we can actually understand what's going on with us and why we're cleaving to such like people. Because there may be something that we don't want to see. Now, Yache, he's coming to divide us from those things that we're cleaving unto. Can we read Luke chapter 12, verse 51, please, Cousin? Sure. Luke 12, 51. Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth? I tell you nay, but rather division. So Yahweh is coming to divide us from iniquity. Though we may cleave to our like so that we can stay in it, Yahweh is coming to pull us out of it. And it's only by him that we're actually being pulled out. Because if it, it was up to us, we would have stayed in our iniquity. That's why we were in our iniquity. 
because we had pleasure in it. But it's actually him that's bringing that division and pulling us out of it. So praise Allah. Can we read um, Amos chapter 3, verse 3, so that we can understand that one, it's in a bad sense, it's that we're in agreement with enablers or we're in agreement with iniquity that causes us to cleave to our like. And also, it's actually on the good end that it's going to be us agreeing and cleaving unto Elohim that's going to actually deliver us. Amos 3 and 3. Can two walk together except they be agreed? All right. This next thing that we're going into is where many of us struggle um, when it comes to our emotions and getting involved because the emotions cloud your judgment because it gets placed for the devil. So you actually have, this is where it makes it very, very tough to decipher between the angel of righteousness and the angel of wickedness because they both have place and it gets, it gets very clouded. Um, a lot of times when our emotions get involved and we're in a situation where our emotions are involved, um, but this is where it says that we have to cleave unto wisdom or we have to cleave unto the law. Um, where did it say that at? Um, You're talking about trust in the law as an oracle, is faithful to him as an oracle? There you go. That's it. Yeah. All right. So trust in the law is faithful unto you as an oracle. So this is where we truly have to trust in the law and trust in the commandments and trust in the wisdom that it may be an oracle to us. Even when we are clouded by our own emotions, that we will cleave on to what Allah Hayim says and do what Allah Hayim says, no matter how we may view it in our own sight. And that's what's going to help us get through a lot of situations that may be tough for us emotionally. Uh, can we read 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 through 15, please? Uh, and don't forget the reasoning to get to the place where we're happy with his will to to get out of those emotions. Reasoning, yes. Um, I'm trying to put things in proper perspective. Um, okay. Usually, what happens is, of course, your initial emotion comes. The right thing to do is to go sit upon your bed and to sin not or be angry and sin not so that you actually can think clearly. And during that time of you sitting upon your bed and and sinning not, you're supposed to reason. And that's where you actually think upon the law of Elohim. So the reasoning goes with what I'm saying is to cleave unto the law so that it may be an oracle unto you. And that's, Casa is speaking about the same thing that I'm talking about. Thank you. Hmm. First Corinthians 7 and 10. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband, Verse 12, but to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. All right. So we see if the spouse is pleased to dwell with you, meaning that that spouse is is okay with your beliefs and you doing what's needful for Allah Not a spouse that doesn't respect your beliefs 
and tries to cause you to fall away from doing what's right, right? So we're talking about a spouse, though they may be in unbelief, they're still supportive of your life and your lifestyle and what you're choosing to do. They're not coming as an enemy to then tear you away from what's good and what's pleasing operating in the law of the enemy. Because that's the same thing that happened to Solomon. Solomon was with unbelieving women, one, and also he was with women that were not pleased to dwell with him. So we have to be very mindful of because that part plays a major role in how you go about a situation. And why is that? If that husband or that wife is pleased to dwell with you, why does Allah tell us not to put them away? Can we read 1 Corinthians 7 and 14 through 15, please? Sure. <clears throat> Verse 14. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. I'm going to jump you to 16 before 15. Verse 16. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Right. So you don't know. By them being pleased to dwell with you, they get to see your lifestyle. They get to see Allah on work in your life. They get to see the blessings. They get to see the growth. They get to see the person that you become over time. So you can see how those things can actually impact them to believe. And even along the way, the things that you're learning, they're going to see that those things are good that you're learning. I think it speaks in uh, either, um, I think it's in Deuteronomy or Exodus, where it says, um, how great a people that has such great a law. Yeah. What nation is like unto this nation has law so righteous and so on. It's Deuteronomy chapter four. Thank you. Mm -hmm. right. So you can see how just by actually you actually growing and actually implementing and doing these things and, and changing your habits and perspective to doing what's right according to Allah, how it can impact others around you. All right? So you don't know if you can save your husband or your wife, but the only way you can save your husband and your wife is if they're pleased to dwell with you. Okay. Now, if they're not pleased to dwell with you, okay, let's read 1 Corinthians 7 and 15. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but Allah hath called us to peace. All right. But we know that the spirit of Yahweh is going to move and align all things according to his will. We may have made our own decisions in times past, but Allah is going to rectify everything to show whether it was from him or a decision that we made in our own self-will, right? So everything is going to be rectified. That's why he said he came to divide, right? Because he's going to divide everything that he has ordained and everything that was done on our own accord, right? And these are the things that we we know them by by seeing what's going on according to Allah wisdom that he's given us. And that's how we're able to distinguish what's going on and what is the will of Allah. Right. So we get to see even in Matthew 10 and 34 through 36, it further solidifies that Allah is going to come and do what he's going to do for the sake of his will. Uh, you mind reading that, Casa, please? Sure. Matthew 10, verse 34 to 36. 
Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Right. So this applies to any of us, whether it goes from our immediate family, whether it goes into our friends. It's Elohim is going to do his separating. And there's nothing that we can do about that. We just have to accept it, right? And we have to pay attention to what Elohim, the information and the wisdom that Elohim has given us so that we can see if it's Elohim working or not, right? And that's, that's our guide. Now, when it comes to marriages, let's see how... The husbands are supposed to operate and the wives are supposed to operate. We're going to just jump into this very quickly and then we're going to continue. Um, Colossians chapter 3, verse 19, please. Colossians 3 and 19. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. So husbands, love your wives. And and though they may be if we're going to go into it uh first peter chapter three and seven let's read that and then we'll talk likewise ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered all right so don't be bitter against them dwell with them according to knowledge give them honor and as unto the weaker vessel, right? So in this walk, we know that Elohim is, he's very, very, he holds so much accountability on the men because he understands that the men are leaders. The men are, are the leaders of his kingdom. So we see a lot of times that the man is going to be the one that's going to to grow faster than the women. And that's how Allah ordained it. We've seen it from the beginning, even with Adam and Eve, how Adam, the devil didn't go to Adam because Adam was more founded upon Allah because Allah was dealing with Adam more. And Eve was the weaker vessel. So, in the way, in the scope of Elohim, men are held more accountable than women. And we have to understand that to know that, okay, or your wife may not be where you are, but you can't get bitter against her because she's still trying. Though she may not be where you are, she's trying and she has her own journey to get to the place where Allah wants her to be and not the place where you want her to be. It's the place where Allah wants her to be. So you have to be patient in that so that she can grow and that she can grow in a good environment where she's not stunted by negativity as well. Right? Now for the wives, uh, let's jump over to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, and then we're going to read 24, please. Ephesians 5 and 25, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Verse 24, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Right. And for the wives, they have to learn to submit themselves. All right. And that's something that they have to learn. They have to learn to submit themselves to a man. And we know from growing up, as we've seen, as we're, we're, as we're learning that the things that we implement in one part of our life trickles into the other spaces of our life. Many women didn't learn to be 
subject to their fathers in everything. The many things that they done behind their father's backs, the the things that they they that they did with no one knowing, and and so forth and so forth. These are the things that they learned and became habitual. So you can see how even in this, they have things that they have to learn too. And this is why both husband and wife have to have compassion for one another, seeing that both are learning and growing. All right? Because Allah didn't say what he said for no reason. So let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. It's a work for a woman to get to that point. It's not innate. There's not, I, I can't speak on it, but I, Elohim knows that no woman is at the point where she's obedient and under subjection to a husband in everything. But Allah and willing, we do get there. Okay. So we know what was going on between Sarah and Hagar. If you've been following the lessons, um, we we have spoken of it um, definitely in the pride lesson. Um, and after Hagar came back to the house of Abraham, after the angel of Elohim commanded her, she didn't repent for the things that was going on between her and Sarah, but continued in her hatred for Sarah, which then impacted her son Ishmael. And we get to see the fruits of the labor of not repenting by seeing how Ishmael was operating. All right. So in the realm of learning and having an example in the scriptures of what we're to do in certain scenarios and what spirit is actually operating in those scenarios, we have examples to see what to do. Um, can we read the book of Jasher, chapter 21, verse 11, please? And I think sure. we're going to jump to, it's going to go down to 15, if I'm not mistaken. All right. Jasher, chapter 21, verse 11. And Ishmael, the son of Abraham, was grown up in those days. He was 14 years old when Sarah bare Isaac to Abraham. And Allah was with Ishmael, the son of Abraham. And he grew up, and he learned the use of the bow and became an archer. And when Isaac was five years old, he was sitting with Ishmael at the door of the tent. And Ishmael came to Isaac and seated himself opposite to him and took the bow and drew it and put the arrow in it and intended to slay Isaac. And Sarah saw the act which Ishmael desired to do to her son Isaac, and it grieved her exceedingly on account of her son. And she sent for Abraham and said to him, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for her son shall not be heir with my son, for thus did he seek to do unto him this day. Now, one, we see the effects of Hagar's um, unrepentance, in the spirit that's dwelling in her son because she's teaching her son. The, the mother has authority over the sons, right? So whatever spirit the mother's operating in the children, the sons are going to pick up, especially. It's the same thing that happened to Judah's children. And it's the same thing that happened with here with Hagar. Now, we also get to see Sarah when she's seen what was going on with Isaac and, and Ishmael, it said, and the thing grieved her exceedingly on account of her son. So we get to see Sarah go into her emotion. Right? And she sent to Abraham and said, cast out this bond woman and her son, for her son shall not be heir with my son now. We see the emotion behind Sarah. Now, Though Sarah was in emotion, let's see how Abraham dwelt with this, dealt with the situation, seeing that that one Hagar was unrepentant. Sarah's in her emotions. Let's see what Abraham does. 
Can we read Genesis chapter 21, verse 11 through 14, please? Well, 11, 12, and 14, please. Okay. Genesis 21 and 11. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. All right. Now, we get to see the difference between Abraham and Sarah. It said that Sarah, and it grieved her exceedingly on account of her son. Now, when it came to Abraham, it said, and the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight. So we get to see that Abraham wasn't moved into emotion. Though he seen what was happening, what was transpiring, and he knew it wasn't good, he didn't give into emotions. Let's continue, Kassel. Verse 12, And Elohim said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. In all that Sarah has said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Right. And Abraham waited on Elohim to confirm all things <laughs> because he wasn't in emotions to be hasty. He waited on an answer. So this is why I brought this story up. It's so that we can have an example of what to do in scenarios. So that we may be able to stand, even in scenarios that are hard or that have may have a lot of emotions and a lot of energy may be given off for the environment, for whatever's going on, for us not to give into it. And for us to even go cleave unto Elohim to wait for an answer and be patient. Can we continue in Genesis 21 and 14, please, cousin? Yes, and Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar putting it on her shoulder and the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. So even in the scenario like this, it says, cast out the scorner and contention shall cease. Right. So Abraham was actually following the wisdom of Elohim. Right. Right. And that was Proverbs 22 and 10. Right. Um, Abraham followed the wisdom of Elohim, knowing that if he didn't follow the wisdom of Elohim, and Hagar maintained her position, she would only grow more bitter and angry. So things were only going to get worse. Can we read Sirach 25 and 22, please? Sirach 25, 22. A woman, if she maintained her husband, is full of anger impudence and much reproach right so this is not only pertaining to women but a man too if he be a scorner and bring and bring much contention it's better for the woman to separate for the sake of peace or the man to separate for the sake of peace so that the contentious spouse will understand that you're not in agreement, or you're not in agreement with their behavior and turn and repent for their actions but for we don't want to be enablers of bad behaviors, right? Because if we stay in that relationship, we're saying that we agree and we like what they're doing. And it's never going to change. It's only going to get worse. But rather what? What do we rather do? Can we read 1 Corinthians 5 and 5 so we can understand by rejecting what we're actually doing? Go ahead, cousin. 1 Corinthians 5 and 5. To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Yache. Right. So though you may be giving them up and they may continue in whatever spirit they're operating in, it's actually to save them. 
So though they may go further off into their iniquity or they may be angered or they may go further off into anger or whatever the case is, it's to save them so that Allah could work. So by separating, we're leaving them in their sins by themselves that they're not turning from and Satan has dominion over them. But it's for the salvation that Allah may work on them to do the things that are too hard for us. Seeing that we don't have the power to turn a person from their sins and we can only reason. But if that person repents, we are to accept them, least Satan overtake them in much sorrow. So when they come forth and they repent after the fact, after they're left, and, and Allah does his work in them and they come back and they repent, we're to accept them. But we have to make sure that we are vigilant and that we are proving our friend, right? And not crediting them. We have to see if their actual change. We have to see that they actually make the necessary changes. Right? Let's read on uh, 2 Corinthians 2 and 5 so we can understand that hey, we are supposed to receive them back so that the enemy may not have place. Uh, Second Corinthians. Okay. Second Corinthians 2 and 5. But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many, so that contrawise you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. All right. Now, this isn't the first time that people had to separate for the sake of their deliverance. Even as Paul said, sufficient to such a man is this punishment because that man or that woman didn't want to stop from doing what they were doing. So the punishment is, is sufficient, which was inflicted of many. So this isn't the first time. These people of the scriptures believed and they were doing what was commanded of them by Allah not going according to their own their own mind or their own desires or their own self-will, but doing what Allah instructed in scenarios. Right? Go ahead, Brother Kassam. Wherefore, I beseech you that ye would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things. Right. To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgive anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So we're not ignorant of Satan. First, we want to make sure that that person truly repented by seeing their works. Right? And also, we don't want to give Satan the advantage to swallow them up with sorrow, seeing that they did repent and that they're seeing that we're not receiving them back. Okay. So we want to make sure that we do all things in order and do all things according to Allah. Oh, all right. All right, let's go into walking in wisdom and tough relationships. Um, we got a good example in Hermes. Let's jump into Hermes Vision 2, chapter 3, verse 1, please. Okay. Hermes Vision 2, chapter 3, verse 1. But do thou, Hermes, no longer bear a grudge against thy children, neither suffer thy sister to have her way so that they may be purified from their former sins. For they shall be chastised with a righteous chastisement, unless thou bear a grudge against them thyself. The bearing of a grudge worketh death. Right. Now we see that the angel Finuel was telling Hermes not to bear a grudge against his children, 
for the way that his children were operating toward him. And also not to allow his sister or his wife to have her way to do whatever she wants. Now we see the two things that was hindering Hermes from being perfected in his family structure, right? So one, it said, for they shall be chastised with a righteous chastisement unless thou bear grudge against them thyself. Now it's interesting how his grudge with them was going to was going to affect their salvation. Now, for men, we have to understand being leaders of our houses, how the things that go on with us and our decisions and whatever spirit may be impacting us affects the whole household. Because the bearing of a grudge worketh death. And the way that the bearing of a grudge worketh death is because you start trying to tear down your household. You get that hatred enters in, envy enters in, jealousy enters in. For the one that's supposed to be upholding and, and holding the whole house together, if you're taken down, the whole house falls. So we see how important it is and why Elohim is so on the men, holding them so accountable, because the house is built upon them. So the man has to be strong to be able to hold up everyone else. Let's jump over to the Testament of Gad, chapter 6, verse 1, please. Gad 6 and 1. And now, my children, I exhort you, love each one his brother, and put away hatred from your hearts. Love one another in deed and in word, and in the inclination of the soul. All right. Now, inclination is a person's natural tendency or urge to act or feel in a particular way. So it's, it's what's real or how you truly feel, right? And we have to be at that point where how we truly feel it's love towards one another okay so that's we have to put away that hatred from our hearts uh, continue brother casa please love ye therefore one another from the heart and if a man sin against thee cast forth the poison of hate and speak peaceably to him and in thy soul hold not guile and if he confess and repent, forgive him. But if he deny it, do not get into passions with him, lest catching the poison from thee, he take to swearing, and so thou sin doubly. All right. So as we spoke of before, we got to make sure that we're coming in the right spirit so that we're not causing another person to fall or stumble based off of the spirit that we're operating in. Okay. Uh, let's jump over to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25 and 26, please. 2 Timothy 2, verse 25. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If Allah and preadventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. All right. So we have to, in meekness, instruct those that oppose themselves, as we spoke of earlier. All right. So this is where this applies. Uh, continue, Brother Casa. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Right. So we see that how that applies to the Testament of Gad. We see how that applies to Hermas so that we do not get in a grudge or, do we, or we do not bring forth that death unto our family or unto those that we call our friends and loved ones. Okay. Let's jump over to Proverbs 16 and 32, right? So that we can further understand not to be given over or easily given over to our emotions. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. 
and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. So this is how we should be, right? But we have to take heed when we see the signs of hastiness of emotions in ourselves and in others, right? So we're supposed to be slow to anger and we're supposed to rule our spirit. That means that we have dominion over it, not the, that we cannot be tossed to and fro, okay? Uh, let's jump over to Proverbs chapter 14, verse 29. And then we're going to jump over to Ecclesiastes 79. All right. He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding. But he that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly. So we have to be slow to wrath because that's great understanding. That means that we understand what's going on within us. And we understand what's happening. See, the, the thing with wrath and the, that it a lot of people struggle with is that they don't understand it. So with having no understanding of it, they're easily given over unto it. So, but for us, with all the understanding that Elohim has given unto us, even with the lessons on anger, the lessons on pride, the lessons on narcissism, the lessons on lying. We have a great foundation and understanding of these things so that we can be slow to it, seeing what it is, right? And not being hasty a spirit to exalt folly, to just go off into iniquity, or to just go off into wrath. But instead, we're slow to it. Go ahead, brother. Ecclesiastes 7 and 9. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. All right. So in that, be not hasty in the spirit to be angry. So we don't want to do anything hastily. All right. And also, Sirach 28 and 11. And hasty contention kindleth a fire, and in hasty fighting sheddeth blood. All right. So we see everything that has to do with being hasty, it's not good. And the results of it are not good. All right. So we out, we have to operate in, in understanding and wisdom not to do anything or to do anything quick tempered or, or in a quick reaction to be given over to an emotion that's going to cause us to error. There's a difference when dealing with someone in the church, as we spoke of before. Uh, about dealing with someone outside of the church. Now we're going to be dealing with someone in the church so we can understand how the the wisdom is for that when it comes to a dispute or someone being wronged, right? So we remember after the first and second admonition reject when it comes to a person in the world or when it comes to relationships, right? So we're going to read Matthew 18 and 15, so we're going to understand the protocols when it comes to being in the church. Uh, Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 through 17, please. Matthew 18, verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Right. So we get to see. This is the quote-unquote first admonition, right? So if he's going to hear you, you gain your brother. Go ahead, Brother Casa. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Right. So this is the second admonition. Now, the difference between dealing in the world or dealing in the relationship is that there's actually a third admonition in the church, right? And that's where you have that extra grace when it comes to actually a church environment. Uh, continue, Brother Costa, please. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Right, so then you reject... So when it comes to the church environment, first you go to them by yourself. Then you bring one or two witnesses. 
then you go on to the church and after that you reject which is different than a relationship or a friendship of the world where you have one admonition you go by yourself the second one you go by yourself and after that if they do it again you reject all right so we get to see the difference of the circumstances Uh, can we read Shepherd of Hermit Mandate 4, um, chapter 1, verse 9, so we can understand um, rejecting, please? Sure. Shepherd of Hermit Mandate 4, chapter 1, verse 9. If therefore in such deeds as these likewise a man continue and repent not, keep away from him and live not with him, otherwise thou also art a partaker of his sin. And that's the part where it gets a little it gets a little tricky because you're saying you don't like it, but by you staying there, it's showing that you actually do like it because it's not enough to make you leave. You're actually partaking in their sin because you admonished them once, you admonished them twice, and they didn't repent. And you're becoming an enabler of their sin. All right. So this is what we don't want to do. Um, continue, Casa. For this cause, ye were enjoined to remain single, whether husband or wife. For in such cases, repentance is possible. Amen. So you're doing it for the sake of the repentance. All right. So... You have to just understand the focus of why you're doing what you're doing. No matter what they may say, no matter what they may accuse you of, you have to understand your intention and why you're doing what you're doing and stand on it for Allah sake. Okay. So now, so now we have the understanding of what we do, whether a spouse or a brother or sister. Now, whether a person repents or not, it's not the spirit of Elohim to be bitter or angry with them to avenge ourselves or to give them a taste of their own medicine, as we spoke of before, All right? So we know, as it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 19, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So let's read the Testament of Benjamin and see how we should deal with it being believers. Um, the Testament of Benjamin, chapter 5, verse 3, Brother Kassim, please. Testament of Benjamin, chapter 5, verse 3. For where there is reverence for good works and light in the mind, even darkness fleeth away from him. For if anyone does violence to a holy man, he repenteth. For the holy man is merciful to his reviler, and holdeth his peace. And if anyone betrayeth a righteous man, the righteous man prayeth. Though for a little he be humbled, yet not long after he appeareth far more glorious, as was Joseph my brother. So we're not to avenge, but rather to give ourselves unto Allah. Right. For the holy man, right, he does no violence. Right? And he does what's right in the sight of Allah. He gives himself unto prayer when someone does something wrong to him. Right? And gives it unto Allah and lets Allah do the avenging. Uh, let's jump over to the Testament of Benjamin, chapter 5, verse 1, real quick. Verse 1. If therefore ye also have a good mind, then will both wicked men be at peace with you? Jump into verse 2. If you do well, even the unclean spirits will flee from you, and the beasts will dread you. Mm -hmm. So we see the more that we actually cleave to Allah and the more we actually walk in his law and the fruits of the spirit, and we're destroying the works of the flesh, the more people will be at peace with us. And also, evil spirits will flee from us. So we won't be operating or they won't have place to dwell with us to, to hop in, to hop upon us and, and to operate in us, right? But 
the beast will dread us. They'll be upset with us, seeing that they don't have no place with us or in us. Okay. Now, let's jump on to accountability versus enabling. All right. So first, let's learn being accountable for ourselves. Can we jump into Leviticus chapter 5, verse 1 through 5, please? Sure. Leviticus chapter 5, verse 1. And if a soul sin and hear the voice of swearing and is a witness, whether he hath seen or know of it, if he do not utter it, then he shall bear his iniquity. Now, first off, if a soul sin and hear the voice of swearing and it's witness, right? So you hear someone else swearing and it's witness, whether he have seen it or known of it. If he do not utter it, he shall bear his iniquity. So first off, if we see that somebody do something wrong and we don't say anything, we've erred. That's accountability. Continue, Brother Castle. Or if a soul touch any unclean thing, whether it be a carcass of an unclean beast or a carcass of an unclean cattle or a carcass of unclean cattle or the carcass of unclean creeping things, and if it be hidden from him, he also shall be unclean and guilty. Right. So even if you do something now, of course, this is speaking of what it's speaking about, but this law goes into every aspect. Even if you do something that you're unaware of, according to Allah, you're still accountable for it. Okay. Now let's continue reading and see what it says. Or if he touched the uncleanness of man, whatsoever uncleanness it be that a man shall be defiled withal, and it be hid from him. When he knoweth of it, then he shall be guilty. Right. So though you may not you may not know, and it may be hid from you, because you may have did, done it in ignorance, or you may not have the understanding of it, though when you understand it, you're guilty of it, and you have to repent for it. Okay? Continue, Cousin. Or if a soul swear, pronouncing with his lips to do evil or to do good, whatsoever it be that a man shall pronounce with an oath, and it be hid from him, when he knoweth of it, then he shall be guilty in one of these. All right. So you see that Allah holds us accountable for even the things that we're ignorant of or the things that we're not aware of. All right. So for us, we have to have that same accountability for ourselves and also that same accountability, especially for our brothers and sisters in the church. And of course, our friends. Right? We can't be respect of persons in any aspect. Continue, Brother Costa. And it shall be when he shall be guilty in one of these things that he shall confess that he has sinned in that thing. Right. And take an accountability. And it shall be when he shall be guilty in one of these, that he shall confess that he has sinned in that thing. Right. So that's accountability. Accountability is taking on what you've done wrong or what you've done right and confessing it. Okay. That's accountability. And if if need be for you to change what you've done wrong. All right. Now let's build on being accountable for others. Um, let's jump to the Shepherd of Hermes Vision 1, chapter 3, verse 2, please. Hermes Vision 1, chapter 3, verse 2. But the great mercy of the Lord had pity on thee and thy family, and will strengthen thee, and establish thee in his glory. Only be not thou careless, but take courage and strengthen thy family. For as the smith hammering his work conquers the task which he wills, 
so also doth righteous discourse repeated daily conquer all evil. So we get to see an example of being accountable for others. One, being not careless, taking courage to do what's right, and also to be consistent with doing what's right and not looking at it like it's a hard thing or that a person or not having hope for a person, but strengthening your family, strengthening your brothers and sisters. All right. So as the smith hammering his work conquers the task which he wills, at the blacksmith they're hammering, they're forming the whatever metal it is that they're working on. So also do his righteous discourse repeated daily, conquer all evil. So you can't get lax, you can't get tired. Though you may have to say the same thing over and over, you still have to do it. That one day it'll eventually sink in and that it'll actually be received. All right, so let's let us not get lax. Let us not get careless, but let us take courage. All right. So let's deal with that righteous discourse. Even when it comes to our children or when it comes to our or our significant other, um, you don't know what that righteous discourse may be about, but we have to definitely stay mindful to continue doing it, knowing that it's going to bring forth fruit. Um, let's jump over to Sirach chapter 30, verse 8. Sirach 30 and 8. And horse not broken becometh headstrong, and a child left to himself will be willful. Right. So we get to see that righteous discourse repeated daily. If we're not actually correcting and holding even our children accountable, they're going to become willful and they're going to be headstrong. Right. If we if we enable our children and not correct their wrongs and justify their wrongs, they become headstrong because we never broke them to correct them. And the child left to himself would be willful because we enabled him to do the wrong. We didn't hold him accountable to do what was right. So they're going to become willful in what they're doing because they don't see the wrong in it. Because we've been constantly telling them that they're, they're, they're okay. Or we haven't corrected them which allowed them to feel like they were right because we never said that they were wrong. Continue, Casa. Cocker thy child, and he shall make thee afraid. Play with him, and he will bring thee to heaviness. So if we want to cocker our children, where that means that we're, we want to be their friend, If you want to be the friend of your children, they're going to make you afraid because they're not going to have any respect for you because you're not correcting them. You're not coming in the role of authority that they actually have to respect. And we see that even in the children today, many of the children today in the school system, that the teachers can't tell the children what to do because the children have been cockered. They're not corrected. The, the parents are their friends. And they don't listen to the parents, let alone listen to the teacher. They don't respect the authority. All right? You play with him, and he will bring you to heaviness, or that child will bring you to heaviness. And playing with that child is not correcting them. You don't want to hold that child to a standard. Then that child's going to be willful. 
All right. So we have to make sure that we're holding all toward an accountability, no matter the age. Because as far as the Hebrew children, they have understanding from a young age. So we have to make sure that we're holding them to a standard, not justifying that they're just children, that they're just children and that that's what kids do. Because what happens is, if we leave our children for those spirits to then dwell with them and to operate in them, and before you know it, it's became a habit. And for many of us, it becomes a part of our identity because we've been doing it so long. We say, that's just the way I am. But it's not just the way you are. It's what you learn from a young age and it's never been corrected. So that spirit's been dwelling with you for so long that it makes it hard to come out of it. So we have to be very mindful not to allow those spirits to dwell in our children where they will start operating in such a spirit from a young age where it makes it harder for them to come out of it when they're older. It comes a familiar spirit and thinking it's us after that for so long a time. All right. All right. So let us uh, let us examine ourselves so that we may take accountability and be perfected. Um, let's jump over to Ecclesiastes 11 and 10. Ecclesiastes 11 and 10. Therefore remove sour from thy heart and put away evil from thy flesh for childhood and youth are vanity. All right. So we get to see why childhood and youth are vanity because we this is where we're picking up everything. That's why it says, remove sorrow from thy heart and put away all evil from thy flesh because that childhood and youth didn't help us. By people not correcting us and holding us to accountability, it didn't help us. It only hurted us. It only hurt us. So we don't want to continue that same pattern with our children to not hold them accountable and to be enablers for, th for the wrongs that they're doing. Because we have to understand that these are spirits at work and they don't have any respect that it's a child. All they see is a vessel that they can operate in. So we have a spiritual war even from a young age. And us being that 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 good holy friend, we're supposed to hold our children accountable and to correct them so that that spirit may not have place to, to grow and to operate. Now, we truly have to understand that there are two sides to everything. We have the ways of Alahayim, we have the, the commandments. We have the fruits of the spirit. We have our donor yache. Now, on the other side, there is another side. Let's jump over to Shepherd of Hermes, Mandate 12, chapter 4, verse 6, please. Mandate 12, chapter 4, verse 6. Be ye converted, ye that have walked after the commandments of the devil. Now, hold up. Be ye converted. Ye that walk after the commandments of the devil. So there are commandments of the devil. So we see that there are two sides. Okay. So we have to be very mindful not to be operating in the works of the flesh. And also not to be operating in the commandments of the devil. So it's the same. It's just on the other side. Continue, cousin. The commandments which are so difficult and bitter, and wild, and riotous, and fear not the devil, for there is no power in him against you. Right. Let's continue to Romans chapter 7, verse 5, please. Romans 7 and 5. For when we were in the flesh, 
The motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. So now we get to see what Paul was actually referring to when he said the motions of sin, which were by the law. He was actually talking about the law of the devil. Did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. And he's talking about the works of the flesh, which are the fruits unto death. So that we can actually understand what Paul was actually referring to. Right. Now, motions, which is something undergone that is a hardship or a pain. Right. Affliction or suffering. So the motions of sin, which brings us unto suffering. Right. Which were by the law of the devil. So we see that's what the devil wants. He wants us to suffer. He wants us to go through hard times or heartaches. But that's the opposite of what Allah wants. Allah wants us to operate in wisdom so that we don't suffer. But it's unto us to trust in Allah that we do what's right according to his wisdom and believe it and do it and stand fast in it so that we don't go through afflictions or suffering. Now, as for us, we also have to take accountability for the people we have around us. Uh, let's read Sirach chapter 8, verse 15, and we'll go to a couple of more scriptures, Brother Kasa. All right, Sirach 8 and 15. Travel not by the way with a bold fellow, lest he become grievous unto thee. For he will do according to his own will, and thou shalt perish with him through his folly. So we're instructed not to not to go on away with the bold fellow. So don't join your, join yourself with someone that's bold or that operates very boldly or says what they say or or doesn't have any sense of shame because it's only going to make it grievous for you, All right? Because he's going to do what he's going to do no matter without thinking of anyone else, All right? And that's that boldness, that's that pride. There's no concern or no thought for you or your well-being. So, and thou shalt perish with him through his folly because he's going to take you down with him or she's going to take you down with her because there's no concern for you. Uh, let's read Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, please. Proverbs 16 and 18. Pride goes before destruction and a hearty spirit before a fall. All right. So that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So you get very lifted up before you fall. Okay. Uh, let's read Sirach 42 and 6, please. Sure keeping is good where an evil wife is. All right. So sure keeping is good where an evil wife is or evil husband is. So to make sure you keep account of everything, just to make sure that Everything's accounted for, okay? Because you don't, just don't know. You, remember, you have to be vigilant of the people around you, yeah. right? So you have to make sure that you are you know what's going on around you to be able to catch things when they may happen, right? And if you're not sure keeping and making sure that you know where everything is and what's going on, then things can happen around you without you knowing. And then it'll end up, It'll end up catching you later on down the road, not being aware of it. Um, Sirach 26 and 11, please. Watch over an impudent eye and marvel not if she trespass against thee. All right. So you got to watch the eye. If you see that they have lust in their heart, don't marvel if that person trespass against you, whether man or woman. All right. So you need to be watchful and mindful, seeing how a person is operating, right? So we'll watch over that lustful eye, right? Um, let's jump over to Sirach 28 and 2, please. Sirach 28 and 2. Forgive thy neighbor the hurt that he hath done unto thee, so shall thy sins also be forgiven when thou prayest. All right, so we're going to make, we're gonna make sure we forgive. And I didn't want to go on saying these things and not bring forth that we have to be very forgiving, even in the midst of the different people that we may be dealing with and family. Somebody's going to hurt us. It's just 
something that happens, everybody's going to make mistakes, right? So we have to forgive, and so shall our sins be forgiven us when we pray, okay? Um, Titus chapter 3, verse 2, please. Titus chapter 3, verse 2. To speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. So we have to grow in compassion, seeing how much compassion Elohim has had on us. Let us not forget our past and journey and how we were like them as well at one point in our lives. Let's jump over to Titus chapter 3, verse 3, please. Sure. Verse 3. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. All right. So we've all done these things in our time in times past, though we may have came a long way from where we were, we can't be forgetful and not be able to to have that compassion or that understanding of where other people are in their journey. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, please. 1 Corinthians 13, 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. All right. So seeing that the things that we've done are wrong, or seeing the things that we may learn from our youth that are wrong, we have to put those things away, right? And that is part of our growth and our journey and our accountability is putting those things away and being able to admit that they're wrong and turning from them and changing. Let's jump over to Sirach 28 and 6, verse 8, please. Sirach 28 and 6. Remember thy end and let enmity cease. Remember corruption and death and abide in the commandments. Remember the commandments and bear no malice to thy neighbor. Remember the covenant of the highest and wink at ignorance. Abstain from strife and thou shalt diminish thy sins. For a furious man will kindle strife. All right. So remember thy end, right? So all of us have to remember the goal of what we're going towards. And that's going to destroy the enmity. If we see that, hey, I know I have to do these certain things to get to where I want to get to. I have to bear the fruits of spirit. I have to keep the commandments. These are the things that I have to do to get to where I want to get. Remember where I'm trying to go. It's going to help us abide in the commandments. All right. So it's going to also help us remember the covenant of the highest. And it's also going to help us wink at ignorance. So we're not going to take it personally. All right? So we don't want to take people's ignorance and the things that they do wrong personally, where it gets us into our emotions and gets us into strife. That's why it says, abstain from strife, and thou shalt diminish thy sins. So don't get into your emotions and don't take things personal. And you're going to diminish thy sins. For a furious man will kindle strife. Right? So we getting all into our emotions and taking things personal. We're going to kindle strife. And it's going to cause us to sin. Right? All right, now let's jump into an enabling since we went into accountability. Let's jump into enabling. Um, enabling means to give someone or something the authority or means to do something. For an example, justifying their bad behaviors. Okay. Now we're going to jump into Acts with Ananias so that we can understand um, an example of enabling in the scriptures. Let's jump into Acts chapter 5, verse 1 through 4, please. All right. Acts chapter 5, verse 1. 
But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold the possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. All right. So we see right here, Ananias and his wife sold the possession. They kept back part of the price of the possession. And Ananias' wife knew what happened and was privy to it, but didn't hold him accountable. She was an enabler. She enabled his bad behavior. So we get to see an example of it. And we also get to see how Alahayim views it. Let's continue, Casa. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price of the land? Now, what caused them to enable? Now, this is, <laughs> this is where it gets a little interesting. Peter said, Ananias, why have Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Why has Satan filled thy heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? So Satan was guiding Ananias to do the wrong. And Sapphira took part in his sin, not correcting him to hold him accountable, but enabling him. So she took part in the sin that Satan caused her husband to operate in. Continue, Casa. Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto Allah. So we get to see why we don't take things personal. You see, Peter didn't take it personal what Ananias did, knowing that it was unto Elohim that Ananias did it, which kept Peter from strife. So we're actually learning in multiple aspects of how to deal with situations and how to view situations so that it can keep us from going off into our own emotions or taking things personal, right? For even Hermes enables his children. Now, though Hermes' children were disrespecting him and his wife was um, going as she will, Hermes had his part to play as well. For even Hermes enabled his children and his wife not correcting them and not holding them accountable for their actions to do right. Um, let's look at the Shepherd of Hermes, Vision 2, Chapter 2, Verse 2, please. Shepherd of Hermas, vision 2, chapter 2, verse 2. Thy seed, Hermas, have sinned against Allah and have blasphemed the Lord and have betrayed their parents through great wickedness. Yea, they have got the name of betrayers of parents. Now, they betrayed their parents, right? So first, they sinned against Allah which this is why we shouldn't take anything personal because they're doing it unto Allah and they have blasphemed the Lord. They didn't, they didn't say that they blasphemed Hermes. And have betrayed their parents through great wickedness. Yea, they have got the name of betrayers of parents. Go ahead. And yet they did not profit by their betrayal. And they still further added to their sins, wanton deeds, and reckless wickedness. And so the measure of their transgressions was filled up. But make these words known unto all thy children, and to thy wife who shall be as thy sister. For she too refraineth not from using her tongue, wherewith she doeth evil. But when she hear these words, she will refrain and will find mercy. Now look at this. Why did the angel Fenuel tell Hermes 
to say these words because Hermes wasn't speaking up in his own household. Hermes was enabling by not correcting them. So then the angel had to give Hermes the words to go speak unto them. He had to take courage and do what the angel told him and say what the angel told him to then save his household. Continue, Casa. And after that, thou hast made known unto them all these words, which the master commanded me that they should be revealed unto thee. Then all their sins, which they sinned aforetime, are forgiven to them. Yea, and to all the saints that have sinned unto this day, if they repent with their whole heart and remove double-mindedness from their heart. So we see how Allah is not an enabler, but holds everyone accountable to fulfill his will and not the will of ourselves. Right? He said, because the angel Fenuel said, which the master commanded me that they should be revealed unto thee. So, so Yache sent those words to Fenuel to give to Hermes. And he's like, Allah is not an enabler. He holds us accountable. Now, when it comes to fornication and adultery with a spouse, um, let's go over how we're supposed to handle that so that we can understand the different scenarios. We're going into all these different scenarios so that we can understand according to scripture how we're supposed to deal with it. Okay, let's jump into Hermes Mandate 4, chapter 1, verse 4, please. Hermes Mandate 4, chapter 1, verse 4. I say to him, Sir, permit me to ask thee a few more questions. Say on, saith he. Sir, say I, if a man who has a wife that is faithful in the Lord detect her in adultery, doth the husband sin in living with her? So long as he is ignorant, saith he, he sinneth not. But if the husband know of her sin, and the wife repent not, but continue in her fornication, and her husband live with her, he makes himself responsible for her sin, and an accomplice in her adultery. Right, so let's touch on this, right? So if a husband's living with her or a wife is living with her husband and she's ignorant that he's operating in adultery, right? I mean, dealing with someone that's not their wife or not their husband. And that person is ignorant. They don't sin. But if they know what's going on, and say the person hasn't repented, right? So you came forth with the admonition, they didn't repent, All right? If you continue to live with them, you make yourself responsible for their sin. You're partaking in their sin. And the reason being is because you're enabling it. You're not standing against it to, to say that, hey, I'm not in agreement with what you're doing. Right, so whether they be in adultery, whether they be in fornication, it's the same thing. Right? Whether that be for your children, whether your children be in fornication, we have to stand against that as well. All right, we can't just allow them to dwell knowing that they're doing something that's wrong. We have to hold them accountable. We can't enable them and say, no matter what you do, I'm still going to be here to make sure that you're okay. When you're doing what's wrong, I can't support you when you're not doing right. And that's enabling so we definitely have to understand that. Yeah. Because of the things we have to go through for us to change. And if we're there trying to protect a person from everything, it doesn't give them a chance to come to repentance. They're going right. to be willful and come ahead strong. Right. That's correct. 
I'm ready when you are, Kyle. Chapter 1, verse 6. What then, sir, say I, shall the husband do? If the wife continue in this case, let him divorce her, saith he, and let the husband abide alone. But if after divorcing his wife he shall marry another, he likewise committeth adultery. Right. All right. If then, sir, say I, after the wife is divorced, she repent and desire to return to her own husband, shall she not be received? Certainly, saith he. If the husband receiveth her not, he sinneth and bringeth great sin upon himself. Nay, one who has sinned and repented must be received, yet not often. For there is but one repentance for the servants of Allah. For the sake of her repentance, therefore, the husband ought not to marry. This is the manner of acting enjoined on husband and wife. So we see that this is actually the same law as before. Just like in the church, when one is doing wrong and they have to be, um, you have to reject them for the sake of them, their repentance. You also have to receive them once you see that they're truly repented through their works. Right? You just don't receive them ignorantly without them proving that they've actually changed and, and they actually repented through their works, right? Because they actually have to bring forth fruit worthy of repentance, right? So we actually get to see how it's very similar and how Allah is very similar and not, and not a hypocrite when it comes to accountability and when it comes to doing what's right. Uh, go ahead, Brother Kassim. For the sake of her repentance, therefore, the husband ought not to marry. This is the manner of acting enjoined on husband and wife. Not only, saith he, is it adultery if a man pollute his flesh, but whosoever doeth things like unto the heathen committeth adultery. If therefore in such deeds as these likewise a man continue and repent not, keep away from him and live not with him. Otherwise thou also art a partaker of his sin. For this cause ye were enjoined to remain single with a husband or wife, for in such cases repentance is possible. So we see that we're not supposed to partake in others iniquity right we're supposed to actually speak against it to hold them accountable and if they don't stop we separate from them all right that's how Allah holds us accountable and that's how he expects us to hold one another accountable okay now there are different circumstances with that uh, we have the example with Abraham when he had two wives, Sarah and Hagar, for different examples. But in the end, it's the same thing. You don't take on another wife because one of your wives is separated from you. You have to give them room for repentance. So it's just little variables that change. All right. Now let's jump into parenting. Okay. Okay. Let's really dive into parenting, um, especially when it comes to accountability and enabling. Um, let's jump into Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, please. Ephesians 6 and 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now, this is where we're going to start off. You notice it says, children, Obey your parents in the Lord. Okay? So this is for our understanding. We have to obey our parents within the confines of the commandments. Okay? We don't obey our parents to then do something that is against Allah. That is that is the boundary. Okay? That's why it says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. 
it's not for our parents to have dominion and control over us and to cause us to go off and to to do what's according and what's right in their own in their own sight. But we still, if they're an unbeliever, we have to do what's right in the sight of Allah first and foremost. And then honor our parents. All right. Now let's read Matthew chapter 10, verse 37, so that we can we can validify all things. Matthew 10 and 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Right. So one, we can't love our father or mother more than Elohim to put them over the commandments of Elohim. And also, we can't love our son or our daughter more to put them over the commandments of Elohim. Okay. So that's something that that's that that's that boundary that we need to have. Okay. That we can't put no person above Elohim. Though we reverence our parents and hold them in honor, we still can't place them above Elohim. Um, let's read Ephesians chapter six, verse two, please. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. All right. Now the word honor is G5091. And that word means to prize, that is, fix a valuation upon, by implication, to revere. Okay, so that's the important word there, to revere, to honor, to value them. Okay, so we also have a duty to show our respects to the aged and young men and women as well. So along with revering, um, reverencing our parents, but not above Elohim, right, and his law. We also have our duty to the aged men and women and the young men and women. Uh, let's read 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, please. 1 Timothy 5 and 1. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren. Right. So we don't want to just um, be um, casting judgment upon our elders. But we want to entreat them as a father. We want to have that same that same love. We want to have that same love and reverence toward them. And the young and the young men, uh, excuse me, and the younger men as brethren. All right. So we have to love the younger men, even as we love ourselves as brethren. To love to love them as you love yourself. All right. So don't treat just because they're younger. You don't treat them with less love as you treat yourself. And that's one of the things when it comes to younger, um, to people that are older, they have this, this stigma that they can treat younger people however because they're older. But that's the contrary. We're supposed to treat them the same and still hold them to the same accountability and to treat them as we want to be treated so that they can understand how to be treated correctly. Let's continue reading, Casa. The elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters with all purity. All right. So we're supposed to have that same reverence for the elder women and the younger women as sisters. So we're supposed to treat them as maybe our little sister, right? In all purity. That means that we don't have no type of um, backdoor thoughts or iniquity or fornication in us where we're having other thoughts or we're operating in guile, right? So we're operating in purity toward them and treating them like a little sister and loving them as we love ourselves, not demeaning them or treating them differently because they're younger, but holding them accountable as well. For us to truly take accountability and see all things in clarity and truth, we have to be able to see the wrongs of our parents against Elohim so that we may not reverence them above Elohim. So that's the reason why we have to see the wrongs of our parents so that we don't reverence their way above the ways of Elohim. 
to think that the way that they did something was better than the way Elohim is telling us to do something. All right. And that's very important. Very important. Uh, let's jump over to Leviticus chapter 26, verse 39 through 42, please. Leviticus 26, 39. And they that are left of you shall pine away in their iniquity in your enemies' lands. And also in the iniquities of their fathers shall they pine away with them. Now, interesting. This verse says, and also in the iniquities of their fathers shall they pine away with them. All right? So that means that those that actually hold the values or the ways that their fathers or their mother have actually taught them to do, that are against the ways of Elohim, they're actually going to pine away in. They're actually going to die away in, right? And this is what we don't want. We don't want to try to hold on to a tradition or a custom or the ways of our parents that may not be right according to Elohim. And putting that above Elohim because of our reverence toward our parents, which causes us to stumble. Continue, Brother Costa, please. If they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass, which they trespass against me, and that also they have walked contrary unto me, and that I also have walked contrary unto them and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled, and they then accept the punishment of their iniquity, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and also my covenant with Isaac and also my covenant with Abraham will I remember, and I will remember the land. Right. So we see that if, if the way that your parents are teaching you is against or contrary to the ways of Elohim, that's one of the things you need to confess and take accountability of. You see, all of these things have to do with accountability. That's why Elohim is so, so uh, stagnant on accountability. But the ways that are against him is enabling. So we see that that's what the devil operates in. The devil operates in enabling, where no one can correct one another. No one is wrong. Everyone is right. Everybody has their own truth. See, so when you get into things like that, you can clearly see that, hey, this is not Elohim working. This is the devil working, and it's causing me not to take accountability for anything, which therefore leads me to my own self-will or to be willful and to sin against Elohim. We have to understand that everything is against Elohim. So... But let us keep that in mind so that we can come out of it. Um, let's jump over to Sirach chapter 3, verse 10 um, and 11, please. Sure. Sirach chapter 3, verse 10. Glory not in the dishonor of thy father, for thy father's dishonor is no glory unto thee. All right. So make sure that when you are confessing, the sin of thy father or thy mother, that you're not glorying in it. There's not like a glory that you're lifting yourself up over them because of their their shame or something that they did that was wrong and not right in the sight of Elohim, right? So don't glory in the dishonor of thy father. So thy father dishonor is not a glory unto thee, right? Go ahead, Casa. For the glory of a man is from the honor of his father. And a mother in dishonor is a reproach to the children. All right. So the glory of a man from the honor of his father. So you should want. See, this is where we get into that 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 spirit of hatred. You should want your father to be honored. You should want your father to do what's right. You shouldn't want to, to see him fall, to see his downfall. And the same for your mother. You shouldn't want to see the downfall of your mother to say, oh, you were wrong. No, you should want her to do what's right. And that's the love 
versus hatred. Because the mother in dishonor is a reproach unto the children. If the mother is doing wrong, it's going to bring wrong unto the children because that's how people view you. Think about it. If somebody's mother is a prostitute or, or, or doing things that she's not supposed to be doing, how do they view the children of that mother? Negatively. Right. So your mother and her downfall is not an honor to you. So you should want your mother to do right. You should want your mother to prosper in righteousness and doing things right and being on the right track. That's the love of Allah. Now let's see how we can dishonor our parents in scripture. Since it says a mother in dishonor is a reproach unto the children. How can we dishonor our parents in scripture? Uh, let's jump over to Sirach chapter 22, verse 3 through 5, please. Sirach 22 and 3. An evil nurtured man is the dishonor of his father that begot him. And a foolish daughter is born to his loss. All right. So an evil nurtured man is the dishonor of his father. All right. So that's a, a man operating in hatred. So we don't want to have that hatred in our hearts where we're glad when our parents mess up or when our parents don't know something. We want to see our parents thrive just as our parents should want to see us thrive, right? And a lot of times we speak on narcissism. A lot of times the parents don't want to see the children thrive because of that same hatred, narcissistic spirit, where they don't want the children to be better than them. So we have to, we have to come out of those spirits. And also the children, we don't want to see them operating in, in anger or hatred or resentment to their parents to want to see their parents be in dishonor or to fall. Okay. So we just have to grow in love here. Uh, continue, Casa. A wise daughter shall bring an inheritance to her husband, but she that liveth dishonestly is her father's heaviness. Okay. Well, why daughter shall bring an inheritance to her husband, right? Because she's going to do what's right. She's going to operate in righteousness and uprightness. But she that liveth dishonestly is her father's heaviness because she never, just as we spoke before, she never learned how to submit herself to a man. So she's not going to honor her father and she's not going to honor her husband to bring an inheritance. So this is why these things are so important that we're speaking of, because they play in different aspects of our lives. Continue, Brother Casa, unless you got anything. No, that's good. She that is bold dishonoreth both her father and her husband, but they both shall despise her. And that's exactly what happens. And as you see the times that we're in right now, how the spirits are on the women to make them bold, right? She dishonors both her father, and if she be married, she dishonors her husband too. And they both shall despise her. See, this is the part of the story that doesn't get told. It's how the father feels toward the daughter that's that's being bold and, and, and dishonoring him. How else can a, a, a child dishonor their parents? Let's read um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4 and 5, please. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 4. Every man praying or prophesying with his head covered dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. Right. So... A man that prays with his head covered dishonors his father, and he dishonors Elohim. A woman that prays or prophesies with her head uncovered 
or goes out in the world, which I should have put that scripture in there, or goes out into the world uncovered, dishonor of her head. So she, if she's married, she dishonor of her husband, she dishonor of her father, and she dishonor of Elohim. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. So if a woman shaves her head, she dishonor of her head. She dishonor of her, her father and her husband and Elohim. So we're truly getting to see how we can actually dishonor our father in more ways than one, or dishonor our parents in more ways than one. Okay. Do you want to read that scripture, Kassel? You talking about the one for the um, shameless in the world? Yeah. I can get it. It's uh, Acts of Thomas, chapter 55, speaking of the women in torments. Those hung up by their hair are the shameless, who are not ashamed at all to go about with uncovered heads in the world. So we see that's another shame that you bring upon your parents. That was... So how do we honor our parents, seeing that we found out some of the ways that we can dishonor them? How do we honor our parents? Let's look at Sirach chapter 3, verse 7 and 8, please. Sirach chapter 3, verse 7. He that feareth the Lord will honor his father and will do service unto his parents as to his masters. Honor thy father and mother both in word and deed that a blessing may come upon thee from them. All right. So you want to honor your parents in word and in deed. All right. Now we see that Jacob took care of his parents when he actually had the means to do it. Um, let's look at Jubilees chapter 29, verse 15, please. Jubilees chapter 29, verse 15. And he sent unto his father Isaac of all his substance, clothing and food and meat and drink and milk and butter and cheese and some dates of the valley. And to his mother Rebekah also four times a year between the times of the months, between plowing and reaping and between autumn and rain season and between winter and spring to the Tower of Abraham. Mm -hmm. So we see when, when Jacob was doing well, he was able to provide for his family and also provide for his parents. Um, let's look at Sirach chapter 29, verse 20, please. Help thy neighbor according to thy power, and beware that thou thyself fall not into the same. Right. So we've seen that Jacob, when he was doing well, he was able to help his parents. But we have to be mindful if we're not in that position, that we don't put ourselves into a bad position trying to take care of more than what we are able. Right. So help thy neighbor according to thy power and beware that thou thyself fall not into the same. So if we don't have it like that, don't try to put it upon yourself to then try to do more than what you're capable of, All right? Let's jump over to Jubilee chapter 29, verse 19, please. So uh, Jubilee 29, 19. And Isaac went up from the well of the oath and dwelt in the tower of Abraham, his father, on the mountains of Hebron. And thither Jacob sent all that he did send to his father and his mother from time to time, all they needed. And they blessed Jacob with all their heart and with all their soul. And let's jump over to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, please. 1 Timothy 5 and 8. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he had denied a faith and is worse than an infidel. All right. So let's make sure that we provide for our own households before we want to branch out and help others. Let's make sure we take care of home first. Now, what are the benefits of honoring your parents? Let's jump over to Sirach chapter 3, verse 3 through 6, please. All right. Whoso honoreth his father maketh an atonement for his sins. 
and he that honoreth his mother is as one that layeth up treasure. Whoso honoreth his father shall have joy of his own children, and when he maketh his prayer, he shall be heard. He that honoreth his father shall have a long life, and he that is obedient unto the Lord shall be a comfort to his mother. Amen. All right. So we see the benefits of honoring your parents and how to honor your parents. Um, being obedient unto Allah, which allows you to be a comfort to your mother. Let's look at uh, Ephesians chapter six, verse three, please. That it may be well with thee and thou mayest live long on the earth. All right. We have to become lights that pray for people, right? Let's look at Surat chapter 19, verse 19, please. Surat 19 and 19. The knowledge of the commandments of the Lord is the doctrine of life. And they that do things that please him shall receive the fruit of the tree of immortality. Keep going. Uh, we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the Allahim of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of Allahim, should shine unto them. And that's what we are here to do, right? We're making sure that we walk and do what's right in this world so that the light of Allahim may shine forth so that those that can't see, the light will shine upon them, okay? So we have to be mindful of our works and the things that we're doing to show forth the light of Allah and the light of Christ, Yache. Okay. All right. Let's jump on to being impartial to all men. Okay. We definitely did a lesson on this. I'm just going to touch on it briefly in this lesson just so that we can get a full understanding of everything that we should be doing, um, being believers and also being good people. Uh, let's jump into Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 16, please. Deuteronomy 1 and 16. And I charge your judges at that time, saying, Hear the causes between your brethren, and judge righteously between every man and his brother and the stranger that is with him. Right. All right. So let's make sure that we are judging correctly. And how do we do this? Uh, let's look at Sirach 11 and 7 and 8, please. Sirach 11 and 7. And blame not before thou hast examined the truth. Understand first in their rebuke. Answer not before thou hast heard the cause, neither interrupt men in the midst of their talk. All right, so we have to be patient and impartial to give all men a chance to explain their cause and discern after hearing the whole matter. Let's jump over to Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 17, please. Ye shall not respect persons in judgment, but ye shall hear the small as well as the great. Ye shall not be afraid of the face of man. For the judgment is Allah Hayyams. And the cause that is too hard for you, bring it unto me and I will hear it. So whether it's children or adults, the small as well as the great, we can enable their wrongdoings, but correct them and hold them accountable for their works. And if one has understanding of the matter, let him give the understanding of what's working against them to work the sin within them. And also, we have to hear our children out. Right? We have to give them a chance to explain their cause. Right? We can't just shut them down because they're children. Because we have to love them as we love ourselves. We would want to be heard. We would want to explain our cause. And we also have to give them that same, that same liberty. All right? Let's jump over to Sirach chapter 5, verse 12, please. Sirach 5 and 12. If thou hast understanding, answer thy neighbor. If not, lay thy hand upon thy mouth. All right. So we have to watch, least pride enters into our hearts to speak on things we're not knowledgeable about, to uplift ourselves over others. 
right? So that's one thing we definitely have to be mindful about. If we don't have any understanding of what it is, then let us be, be quiet or to seek someone that does have the understanding so that we can help, right? Let's jump on to Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 19, please. Thou shalt not rest judgment. Thou shalt not respect persons, neither take a gift. For a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of the righteous. All right, so for the spirit of fornication, that spirit will actually enter into our hearts and we'll be seeking the things we can gain. And by not wanting to lose the privileges, we would omit correction. And there's many people that will manipulate you using this tactic of gifts. Okay, so we have to be very mindful that we're not overlooking things that people are doing that are wrong and not correcting it for the sake of what we can gain. Okay. Let's jump over to Proverbs chapter 24, verse 23, please. These things also belong to the wise. It is not good to have respect of persons in judgment. Let's jump over to 20, Proverbs 28 and 21, please. To have respect of persons is not good. For, for a piece of bread, that man will transgress. All right. So we see. We have to be aware of our desires so that they don't blind us from what's right in the sight of Allah Hayyam. Okay, so that's what that verse is actually speaking of. Uh, let's jump over to James chapter 2, verse 1 through 9, please. All right. All right. James chapter 2, verse 1. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Yahweh Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring, in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and you have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and, and say to him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the other, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not Allah chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? All right. So we have to be careful not to focus on the outward appearance, for that's the ways of the world. But Allah focuses on the inner man. All right. So just as we said, we have to try a man by his life, right, to really see if a man is really righteous and doing what's right by seeing how they conduct themselves, how they treat others, how they deal in their families, and how they deal with situations to really see who they truly are. All right, continue, Cosmo. But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Now, this is interesting, for we're oppressed by the government. Why would we then follow in their ways to oppress others in the same hypocrisy and in the same manner? Right? So we're oppressed by rich men. So as soon as we get the chance, are we going to then operate the same? Or are we going to do what's right in the sight of Allah? Continue, Kasa. Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called? If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbors thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect of persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And he's going into First Peter chapter 1, verse 16. <laughs> It's all right. It goes, it flows, don't it? It did. I was like, I was like, ooh, I didn't remember the book said that. <laughs> so the uh, first Peter 1 and 16, you can go ahead. And if you call on the Father who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. All right. So Allah judges every man according to their works, 
So we too have to rebuke each other in love according to our works to not suffer sin upon our brother or sister in hopes that they may examine their ways and change to not walk in sin. Let's continue in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25, please. Wherefore, put away lying. I'm sorry. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. All right. So let's not lie. Right. Let's not enable, but let's speak truth and hold each other accountable because we're all members one of another. We're all the body of Yache. Right. We're all the body of Christ. Right. So we have to, we have to make sure that we're taking care of the body and making sure the body is well and not hurting or not damaged. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So how do we go about in the world? Uh, let's read the letter of Ignatius to the Ephesians, chapter 10, verse 1 through 3, please. Ignatius to the Ephesians, chapter 10, verse 1. And pray ye also without ceasing for the rest of mankind, for there is in them a hope of repentance, that they may find Allah Hayyam. Therefore, permit them to take lessons at least from your works. Against their outbursts of wrath, be ye meek. Against their proud words, be ye humble. Against their railings, set your prayers. Against their errors, be ye steadfast in the faith. Against their fierceness, be ye gentle. And be not zealous to imitate them by requital. Let us show ourselves their brothers by our forbearance. But let us be zealous to be imitators of the Lord, vying with each other who shall suffer the greater wrong, who shall be defrauded, who shall be set at naught, that no herb of the devil be found in you. But in all purity and temperance abide ye in Christ Yache, with your flesh and with your spirit. Amen. All right. If anybody has any questions, please send us an email at HebrewReaders at gmail.com. Again, you can visit the website at www.HebrewReaders.com. Um, we thank you all. We pray that this lesson really helped you just to navigate through life and to grow in your relationships with one another and also your relationship with Allah Hayim. And we thank you for your support. And we hope that Allah and blesses you and keeps you. Uh, Brother Costa, you got anything? That's very good. Praise Allah. Hayim. Thank you. Allah Hayim keep you all. And until the next time, make sure you hit the subscribe button and hit the bell so you can know when we put forth any new videos. Thank you for your support. Ciao. HRC, 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 Hebrew Reader, Hebrew Reader, Hebrew Reader Church.